Good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to see everybody here and uh, to welcome you to the inauguration seminar and sort of kicks off a couple of days of festivities around inauguration. I'm, I'm just delighted to see so many people here. Um, I'm Shereen Gabriel, I'm a president of Rush University and chief academic officer of the uh, Rush University System for Health. And I guess um, I'm gonna say universities are a place for where new ideas and new ways of thinking are allowed to flourish and grow. And that's exactly what we hope to do here today. So we've got two very exciting plenary speakers and you'll hear about them in, in just a moment. And four of our own uh, Rush experts that will join us in a panel after the plenary speakers are finished to sort of engage you in a discussion and get your ideas and comments on uh, what we're sharing today. So that's just uh, to prepare you to think about your questions, think about your comments, because we really will want to hear from you. But before we jump into that, um, I'd just like to recognize some special guests with us today who've been so instrumental to the growth of Rush and the growth of Rush University. We have uh, right here in the front row, Carol Siegel, Chair of the Board of Governors and member of the Board of Trustees trying to hide in the back somewhere, I think uh, was Bob Wislow, Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees, uh, Board of Governors, pardon me, and member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Allison Coates is one of our newest members of the Board of Governors, and when she heard we were having this uh, uh, session, at her very first meeting, she says, I wanna be there, so thank you for joining us. Um, I thought we expected, um, uh, a couple of other folks, uh, a couple of other students, but I don't actually, a couple of students, but I don't see them. I also wanted to uh, recognize some additional members of our Board of Trustees. I'm just uh, really delighted that Joan and Paul Rubschlager have decided to join us today, have honored us with their presence. They're such close friends of Rush, and it's just wonderful that you're sharing this afternoon with us. Christy Hefner is here. Um, I haven't seen Pamela Forbes Lieberman or Ann Scott, but they, if they're in the audience or um, they're coming, they're expected. And I just wanted to thank all of you. We have deans, we have vice provosts, we have our two CEOs here. Our uh, retired, recently retired uh, president and CEO, Larry Goodman, is here. And I just, again, wanted to thank everybody for, uh, for coming and uh, for your presence today. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Omar Latif, CEO of Rush University Medical Center and the Stuart Levine um, MD Presidential Chair who will introduce our first speaker, Omar. Well, thank you all for joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce our first plenary speaker, uh, Anish Chopra. Anish was born uh, in New Jersey and went on, uh, despite that, uh, <laughs> to receive his undergraduate degree in public health from Johns Hopkins University and a master's of public policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. In 2006, Virginia's governor, Tim Kaine, appointed Anish as a Commonwealth Secretary of Technology. His service continued in that capacity until he was appointed by President Barack Obama as a U.S. Chief Technology Officer in 2009. He spearheaded a number of innovations in government, and as, when I was preparing to introduce him, I became fascinated with all the different projects that he did. So rather than talk for 20 minutes and give him his time, I'll just highlight a few of them. He created the, the he was the, including the creation of the Productivity Innovation Fund, which provided resources for state agencies to pursue IT projects to improve efficiency. He implemented a statewide governance management strategy the Governing Magazine described as venture governmentalism. And later that year, his work was recognized by Virginia becoming the best managed state in the country. Chopra's appointment as the first chief technology officer of the United States was actually announced by the White House on April 18th in 2009. In that capacity, he went on and promoted technological innovation to help the country meet goals that included job creation and technology to reducing health and health care costs. In 2011, the White House announced the updated strategy for American innovation, which was aimed at innovating in a number of areas of the federal government as part of President Obama's goal to win the future. 
Anish implemented a number of new programs focused on education, research, and infrastructure that were published nationally. Startup America launched in 2011 as a White House program aimed at spurring innovation through entrepreneurship. He helped drive, Anish helped drive the Startup America effort that worked to improve access to startup capital, reducing barriers to entry, to connect entrepreneurs with mentors, and to create new market opportunities in healthcare, clean energy, and education. More importantly, Today, Anish represents in, to many of us a moral conscience of the future of healthcare in making sure patients own their own data, can their own access, and can offer great healthcare. Without much further ado, I would like to thank Anish for speaking today. Oh, man. All right. I don't know about all that. That's, uh, that, that's very kind. And uh, Wow, that was very nice. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, Dr. Gabriel, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. It was uh, an honor to be a part of this important day for you and a celebration here for the Rush family. So thank you for having me. We're going to have some fun in a conversation uh, later, but I thought I might set the stage with just a little bit of context about opportunities uh, and frankly to put into perspective why we need better thinking today to make the healthcare system and frankly, to put America's competitiveness back at the forefront. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna indulge with just a few uh, uh, starting points. Now, this is a little bit of a scary slide, so I was a little bit nervous about starting out this way, but the headline does say it. Uh, America's competitiveness is currently at stake. And, and here's the nature of the problem. The healthcare inflation continues to grow at a rate faster than the overall economy. And based on the budgeting and the accounting ex estimates, uh, it will continue to gobble up more and more of the federal purse, which basically means that we're underinvesting in areas that may be critical for our future. At lunch, we had a bit of a discussion about some of those enabling ingredients of an innovation economy. It used to be the case that roadways, railways, and runways were the cornerstone of an innovation economy. You'd build, you'd build the infrastructure, and of course, Chicago is like a testament number one to just brilliant investments in infrastructure. So, well, we all have to make them better. That's a, that's a, that's a look backward statement, not a fewer statement. But anyway, so the point is uh, we are today hamstrung in our capacity to make investments in the future building blocks, whether that be uh, wireless infrastructure and 5G or artificial intelligence to think about uh, software that affects more and more of our daily lives. Whatever the infrastructure, uh, we are increasingly underinvesting relative to our economic competitors vis-a-vis -vis China. So the economists have said, we need get to get healthcare inflation to no more than the rate of inflation for the overall economy. Mathematically, it only happens two ways. You either put healthcare on a budget, and that means less resources, ration, lower reimbursements, whatever, and that is a path. The country may have this debate. We're having the beginnings of this debate, Medicare for all, et cetera, political debate. But more importantly, there's an alternative view that says, wow, David Ansel, if we found a way to actually address the death gap, if we found ways to make healthcare better, it itself is lower cost to the system. So in theory, and I call this a religion, those of us who are in the religious movement that believes better care is lower cost, this is our moment. We have to hit the economic numbers, and we believe this approach is much better than the alternative. So how do we get there? We've been a decade or so into this middling experiment. We had a big announcement uh, this week. Medicare saved about three quarters of a billion dollars in a program to begin this move to value-based care called the Medicare Shared Savings Program or the ACO program. But in Broad context, while important to have saved three quarters of a billion dollars, uh, that is a fraction of a percent of just the Medicare budget. And so a decade in, that's not, we're not where we need to be. So what is the call to action? And it is this sentence. There, in this religious movement, we believe that if we opened up information and we found ways to either uh, adjust the incentive system and or shine light with transparency. We can identify where people are delivering more valuable care and then to scale those models around the country. So we have 
uh, a response now. We've got to stand up and, and answer this call. Now, this is way too complicated a slide, but I thought I'd share a little bit of context. 2014, uh, we were able for the first time to publish detailed information about where Medicare spends its dollars. It had been illegal for the US government to release this information prior to this uh, milestone. It was, it was seen as a privacy violation of my physician friend, so forgive me. Uh, but, and I don't mean to be rude, I don't know Derek Kunimoto, uh, but Derek Kunimoto, this is the Wall Street Journal, uh, a lot of newspapers took the database and just published it. And Derek Kunimoto happens to be the highest paid doctor from 2015, which is the last time the Wall Street Journal published it. He's a, an ophthalmologist who brought home $11.1 .1 million from Medicare. 75% of his income was tied to injecting a $2,500 drug or a $3,500 drug when a $50 drug is deemed by the National Institutes of Health as a clinically equivalent option. Interesting. 75% of his income from Medicare was on the choice of the drug he chose to inject. By the way, fascinating conversation that it sparked. Who makes the drug? Why aren't they marketing it? Oh, it's the same manufacturer of the $3,500 drug, so maybe they're not incentivized to promote the 50. Fascinating incentives discussion. That was a little bit of love from the lighting system to say we want to save money too. That was an amen, I think, is what I, I'm, I'm sensing from that uh, light. Hallelujah. So now, the next question is, uh, what's the next uh, sort of transparency shoe to drop? Well, we've outsourced Medicare to a bunch of private plans. And those are called Medicare Advantage. And many of us who are in this religious movement think that a path to getting there is to have more people enroll in Medicare Advantage and to get those systems to move faster than the traditional fee-for-service system on the move to value. So that, too, has been a religious movement that had lacked access to data. Last year, and I, okay, I'm an Obama guy, but the Trump administration last year added to the open database and put all the Medicare Advantage encounters data in for one year. So now we can shine light. What happened when we, uh, this experiment of Medicare Advantage? Well, it turns out that uh, we're doing a lot of uh, uh, data arbitrage. It's not so sure we're, we're not so sure we're making better care for people yet, uh, but the early evidence is we found the cohort of 600,000 people who flipped from Medicare fee-for-service into Medicare Advantage from the years 2014 to 15. That group of people, generally speaking, was younger, healthier, and female. So what happened in the year in which they were enrolled in Medicare Advantage? Well, there's some discussion about the actual costs of care and all the rest, but the first thing that caught the researcher's eye, in fact, my team, wow, these folks got a lot sicker in one year the prevalence rate of morbid obesity went up 130%, more than doubled. Either they were eating a lot of you know, uh, Oreos or something, I don't know what was happening, or we just didn't document it in the chart, and so they, they, they put it in the chart. Uh, sadly, uh, the rates of clinical depression went up 95%. So why is that the case? Well, it turns out for a, primary, for a doctor in the community on Medicare fee-for-service, Writing that in the chart doesn't actually get, is there's no economic return, but the sum total of all those codes that were added on day one was about a $3,000 revenue bump to the MA plans. So we don't know yet if the model's working or not, but thankfully we're shining light so we can at least understand and respond to this incentives as they're being uh, uh, played out. Now the last step is uh, putting all of this information to work in the case of Omar's opening, very kind opening remarks to me, uh, about what, how this will help individual patients. Well, one step on that journey is to do what we said in the Affordable Care Act. In the Affordable Care Act, Congress and President Obama said, we're gonna release the Medicare data because we wanna understand the performance of the healthcare system. We don't necessarily want the government itself to say, rush bad, you know, Chicago good or whatever which we have some of this with the star ratings on the hospital side, that's a big controversial issue. But extending that to doctors is a little more squeamish about which doctors are higher performing or lower performing. So, so Congress said in 2010, let's release the underlying information for the purpose 
of the private sector organizing that information to help consumers figure out where they can find higher value care, providers that offer higher value care. So this is a job people are just starting to get done. And you're starting to see, many of you know about the Dartmouth Atlas, the research analysis, the whole Atul Gawande paper on McAllen, Texas, built on the notion that why is there so much clinical variation? And that a good chunk of that variation is unwarranted clinically. So the newest opportunity is that those were aggregate macro statistics. Now we can get much more refined. So uh, researchers, our researchers, other researchers, are examining the question, what should this patient have cost the system if they were navigating to the best practice across the delivery network? And what happened in reality under the watch of XYZ physician? Complicated question, but we are now at a time when there's enough statistical data and tooling to begin that conversation. Uncomfortable as it will be, we are in the decade where we will have this conversation. This, by the way, is a chart that shows by a geographic region, where is there the greatest variation between the best performing primary care doctors and the worst performing primary care doctors? The darker the shade of red, the greater the variation, risk adjusted performance at the physician level. It's just step one of a hundred step journey that the country will be on, but at least we're taking the step. Now, uh, I did share, uh, I share a passion as David does to understand some of these uh, socioeconomic challenges. And uh, in a paper we worked on with Microsoft's research team, uh, we looked at zip codes in the country that are seen, are deemed uh, uh, economically distressed. So this, these blue areas are legally recognized parcels in the city of Chicago that are deemed opportunity zones because of the tax legislation that passed last year. And our research team tried to figure out if you lived in an economically distressed zip code versus those who lived, lived in a healthier or wealthier uh, zip code, what are the basic uh, uh, hand behind your back problems? You're like a third less likely to get a flu shot more than a third less likely to get a free annual wellness visit in Medicare, and absolutely uh, worse on how you get care transition support when you leave the hospital and you go home. Just because you live in a zip code that's economically distressed, there's that much variation. So, to Omar's point, we have to enter an era where individuals and the smartphones that we have in our pockets even those who live on Medicaid and live in the most uh, economically distressed regions, more and more of them have this computing power in the pocket. Now this is helping us manage our photos, but it hasn't yet flipped to managing our health, right? Maybe counting your steps, but that ain't where we need the problems, right, David Ansel? It's not the counting of the steps that's the gap uh, on the death gap, right? We have to use this for much more important uh, uh, healthcare navigation decisions. The CM, uh, a CMS administrator, Seema Varma said, look, we're making a change. If you're a Medicare patient, you can connect any app you trust to four years of your Medicare claims history and weekly updates of your uh, information. By the way, uh, kudos to Rush. Rush is one of the first in the batch of 25 apps that is capable of offering this benefit to Medicare patients. So to Larry, to Omar, uh, congratulations, Rush. By the way, the only health system in the country uh, to do this. A uh, little point of pride here for the people. Good job. But Seema says, during open enrollment, which starts October 15th, and of course we live in an era where policy is by tweet, so her tweet from May says, hey, when you're shopping for plans in open enrollment, go use those blue button apps because they're there to help you make sense of this complicated batch, uh, a batch of information that is otherwise uh, available to you. So this era is in part a bet that if we empowered people and institutions they trust like Rush with their information, Maybe they can, while we're waiting for the system to be fixed top down, maybe they can be empowered to make smarter decisions to naturally fix their own probability of success. To find the high value cancer center that we just talked about 
uh, that may not be accessible on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I'm so proud of the tech team here at Rush. Uh, on stage at the White House just two, three weeks ago, uh, your very own Shafiq Rob stood on stage and said, not only is Rush doing the single patient blue button, we're expanding that to use that same modern internet infrastructure to change the way we interact with insurance companies, clinical registries, and others. The internet economy works in every other sector but healthcare, and we're going to lead the charge. So under Shafiq's leadership the, at the White House, celebrated by the Trump administration, uh, there's now a coalition of organizations on the payers and provider side uh, looking to bring this functionality to life to help doctors on the front lines. Again, thank you to Rush. You can applaud another one. So we, we, we understand the era in which we, and I, I describe this as a leadership moment, and I, and I want to make this uh, clear. My successor, uh, Todd Park, whom I love with every ounce of my soul, he lived through the difficulties of healthcare.gov's failure at launch. And they stitched together the system and barely fumbled through the first open enrollment period and woke up the next day and faced this terrible conundrum. What do we do with the systems for the next year? Do we continue to patch the broken thing that we barely cobbled together over the finish line? Do we throw the whole thing away and start over and risk that we won't get there uh, in, in time for the next system? Well, that was a terrible choice. In that leadership moment, Todd decides to launch two teams. He keeps Team A, the patchwork, barely government contractor laden mess of a system, and then recruits about a dozen engineers from the Bay Area to move into a house. That's the picture of the house they moved into in Maryland, and said, basically, he got six months to rebuild this entire monstrosity. That we spent oh no, nearly a billion dollars of IT spend, but you got nine months, six months. And he said, I'm going to put both teams at the cause. And by September, I'm going to put them against each other, and I'm going to see where we've come. Team A spent $250 million to set up the ID system. How do you set up a username and a password? That has a $70 million IT maintenance cost. Team B put some Google infrastructure in, Spent about four million bucks designing it with about a, uh, you know, a fraction of the cost, about a million dollars in overhead uh, to maintain. Todd decided to go with Team B, and it worked for 70% of all the shoppers on healthcare.gov and open enrollment too. Only the really complicated cases were kicked out to go to the legacy system. Our country is in an A team, B team moment. We will continue to do tinkering on the delivery system in Team A, patchwork, more value-based care incentives, maybe some downside risk, maybe some you know, reshuffling of the deck as to how we're going to move uh, payers and providers and all these ecosystem partners together. That's wonderful. Team A, God bless America. Who's fielding Team B? Team B is going to have access to the data, not only from the patient's uh, claim systems, but from their EHRs, so they'll have a unified view of all of their options. They'll be able to know their directories based on their insurance plan, which doctors are in the network, which ones are not in the network. By the way, why do we have this surprise billing problem? How frustrating. Well, three, we're going to have standards to allow online scheduling. So those intelligent apps could actually help route you and schedule you for that designated cancer center to get that uh, breast imaging study. We'll have better standards for patient assessment. So we're asking the right questions about what is your intent as a patient? You've broken your hip. Do you want to get back and run? Or do you want to be functional for your job? Or how do you want to think about your goals? And we've got to do the performance transparency to say, yeah, you need an orthopedic surgeon. Go to Rush, because they're the best in the country. Right? Top 10? Top 5? Best. <laughs> best! OK. Point is, who's on Team B? Advocating for the patient. To me, that is our call to action. And to sort of bring us home and to segue into uh, Steve's talk, one of the best things that I had the chance to do before I left the administration was that uh, we put out a billion dollar innovation challenge. It was not called Team B at the time, but that was before all the internet standards came to life, but it, the spirit of it was. It basically said, 
the Medicare Innovation Center has the freedom to test any idea and can scale the ones that have evidence. So in the very first round, we put out this billion dollar challenge. We surfaced ideas far and wide. And the idea was we would spend, I don't know, X million dollars, run a clinical trial equivalent for the innovation. And if the actuary of CMS could validate that the idea in, uh, generated improvements in quality and cost, then the HHS secretary would have the authority to scale that intervention all across the country without going back to Congress for permission. The very first graduate of this billion dollar innovation challenge, the most innovative company in the world as it comes to healthcare was of course the YMCA. Huh? The YMCA. They had a diabetes prevention program that said if you're, you're at risk of getting full-blown diabetes, we'll coach you on healthy eating and exercise and everything else, come through the class. Graduates of this class have a much lower likelihood of getting full-blown diabetes. And the actuary said, good Lord, four to one return on taxpayer investment. As of April of 2018, every doctor in the country can prescribe this, what is a $600 voucher for Medicare beneficiaries at no coupon cost. That is the spirit. But who else, who else got this billion dollar innovation grant? It is none other than your next guest speaker, Dr. Meltzer. So you'll hear more about that from him. Thank you so much for your time. Let's go launch Team B and make healthcare better for everybody. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we are, have time for a few questions. If anyone wants to push back, reactions, say that we're nuts. This is, you know, why, why, how was this part of Shireen's opening lecture? Okay. <laughs> questions, thoughts, reactions, comments, no pressure. We're gonna have another panel. Of course, you get the floor, madam. Yeah, so uh, herein lies the fundamental challenge, which is the minute you've released the information for good, there are many institutions that have desires to use it for ill. And so it's sort of a mutually assured destruction, if you will, about the use of data for ill. So take an example, the $11 million doctor, uh, now the drug companies that have the uh, you know, have, have the, uh, you know, the desire to see more and more of their high cost products in the market, know exactly which doctors are in the opposite camp. Now they've known some of that through these surreptitiously shady ways to get data that are not really open data in the traditional sense. They're more like secondary use of sort of clearinghouse data. But by and large, uh, every healthcare use case, there are folks that can uh, uh, earn more and those who will stand to lose some. And in a way, Part of the challenge on the move to value is uh, doing the right thing might actually put the balance sheet of the institution moving to value at risk faster. So the good and the ill of open data is uh, it, it can be used in a manner that actually moves us further away from value, but so too could it be used for good. So therein lies, it, it's about the use of the data, not the underlying data itself. Now, clarifying, in the CMS world and others, very hard to get uh, uh, personally identifiable level data, very strict rules about uh, how one can use that information and how to avoid uh, privacy uh, risk. So that's definitely there. Um, the last piece of the risk here is those consumer apps. Rush, building the Blue Button app is good. Hey, there's Shafiq, the Blue Button app. There he is. So, so, so Shireen, Rush, I can trust that Rush is not gonna use my Blue Button data to route me to terrible care. Right, Omar? Okay, right? But if it's not Rush, but it's Blush, which is an unknown Chinese hacker app that convinced the consumer to trust the app with their uh, blue button, and they were using it to push poor drugs or what, terrible services, that too today is an unprotected, there is no uh, internet privacy uh, legislation in the country, so it's an unprotected, it's not a HIPAA protected uh, asset. Uh, when a consumer invokes their rights, the good news is they have a right, the bad news is when they invoke it, it's out of the HIPAA protected system. So the apps that, that are available have to be seen as trusted apps. So educating the consumer. Yeah, so, so one theory is we're gonna have to educate consumers. I co-chair with Governor Levitt 
something called the Karen Alliance, uh, Governor Levitt, Republican, Democrat, and said, we need to have a bipartisan code of conduct that we want apps to voluntarily adhere to that will avoid the risk that apps will perform badly. And if we had that kind of floor raising, then we could, uh, the Federal Trade Commission could hold you liable for, for deceiving the public if you had signed on to the code of conduct. So there are some uh, marketplace uh, responses to this risk. One more, two more, anyone else? Yes, Christy. So in your A, B example, yep. Yes. If they were successful in you got it. In this model. Ecosystem yes. Yes. Today, yes. The delivery of the actual health services, which is under the control yes. of yes. the existing providers, whether yes. it's a hospital or doctors, yes. does not exist in Team B. It yes. exists in Team A. Yes. And much like energy companies whose historical business model was about selling energy, not yes. energy efficiency, yes. the $11 million ophthalmologist times a million yes. have a vested interest in Team A's modus operandi. Correct. What can we do What's the business model that for team creates B? the incentives for that dramatic changes in business model and behavior to match the providers of those services, the health services, with what Plan B looks like? Yeah, so uh, this is the uh, multi-billion dollar question that's confronting the healthcare investor community, okay? I'm not an investor, but I will tell you that investors are betting that Medicare Advantage products, where they take the full risk up front, have all the economic incentives to drive a more aggressive model to navigate through Team B, as Team B. So that would mean prior offing bad stuff to make it harder for the legacy system to do it. That would mean better decision support to navigate and route people to higher value doctors who on their own don't do those things. And it would mean some form of patient engagement to make sure medication adherence and other factors, you're, you're, you're getting your quarterly checks if you're diabetic, et cetera. So in theory, the Medicare Advantage chassis is pre-built for a business model that rewards the move to value. The fee-for-service analogy is the Trump administration launched something called global direct contracting as an option starting next year. I don't want to put Rush on the spot, but in theory, Rush could move to a direct contracting global risk model on a population and could say, we're going to run our own Team B on that group of people involved in this project, and we have all the economic upside if we get to better value. I'm not saying you do or you don't. It's a big decision, but those are the two bets the country's making. All right, Bala, you get, can you get one more? You get, uh, I got a minute left, fast. Just to react to that. Yeah. yeah. Is there a, it sounds like the payer, it sounds like the payer, the payer is the driver. The is, it, is there ever the patient has the yeah. power? So, so a big debate is whether or not CMS ever launches a payment-led model. There was an experiment three years ago that was withdrawn, which was basically around uh, shared decision making. The notion that if you have back pain and you go to PT first, you don't, you can maybe skip the surgery, okay? And we've got massive variation in this country on rates of surgery when it's not necessarily clinically needed or wouldn't be your first choice. So CMS had proposed an idea that there be a national app. They were gonna procure one or more apps. And that if the app helped you make decisions, the app gets paid money to route you through a more effective system. They, they put out the bid, brought in some apps, and then canceled the project for reasons that are more complicated. But that would be, it would be up to someone who's in the bucket of risk, the payer, like Medicare, to determine if there's a room for a patient-focused Team B that gets a business model around it. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chopra. I have to warn anybody who comes up on the, on the stage here, these steps are kind of slippery, so just, uh, just an FYI. Um, so next I'm gonna introduce Dr. Josh Jacobs. Uh, Josh and I actually go 
way back in the world of uh, musculoskeletal research in our respective organizations. And Josh is going to introduce our next speaker who, with whom um, they work together, UFC and Rush, uh, under the auspices of the CTSA. So maybe you'll mention a little bit about that. So Dr. Jacobs is Vice Provost for Research at Rush University, and we work very closely together there, Vice President of Research, RUMC, and the William A. Hark and Susan G. Swift Chair of Orthopedic Surgery. So Josh, please introduce our next speaker. And uh, <clears throat> just to dispel any rumors, uh, this was not designed by one of my colleagues to increase <laughs> business, although it's a good idea. So, um, Shereen, thanks so much for this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, uh, David Meltzer. Uh, David is currently the chief of the section of hospital medicine, director of the Center for Health and Social Sciences, and the University of Chicago Urban Health Lab, and chair of the Committee on Clinical and Translational Science at the University of Chicago, where he is also the Fannie L. Pritzker Professor in the Department of Medicine, the Harris School of Public Health Policy Studies, and the Department of Economics. Dr. Meltzer's uh, research explores problems in health economics and public policy with a focus on the theoretical foundations of medical cost effectiveness analysis and the cost and quality of hospital care. He currently leads a, a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Challenge that was referred to by Anish. This is an award to study the effects of improved continuity in the doctor-patient relationship between the inpatient and outpatient setting on the costs and outcomes of care for frequently hospitalized Medicare patients. He helped lead the CTSA-funded Chicago Learning Effectiveness Advancement Research Network, or Chicago Learn, and the McCrory-funded uh, patient uh, uh, area, McCrory-funded Patient-Centered Outcome Research Network, or Capricorn. Uh, Meltzer completed his MD and PhD in economics at the University of Chicago and his residency in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has numerous awards, and I list a few here. The Garfield Award from the Research America, the AHRQ Eisenberg Excellence in Mentoring Award, the AAMC Learning Healthcare System Award, and the Society for Hospital Medicine uh, Best Research Innovation Oral Abstract Award. And also, he is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. I've been very fortunate uh, to get to know uh, Dr. Meltzer through our collaboration with the University of Chicago in the Institute of Translational Medicine, that's our CTSA grant. Uh, I've found uh, David to be very forward thinking, very innovative, very visionary in how to deliver health care. He is a real University of Chicago economist and also a top-notch physician, a very rare combination that I think uh, gives us uh, the way forward in improving our health care system. So uh, I've also had the opportunity to meet his family, his beautiful wife, Vinny, and his daughter, Sonia. So David, we're really thrilled uh, that you're part of this. Thank you so much for participating in this important event. Thanks so much. Thanks. It's, it's, it's uh, this will advance. Okay, great. It, um, it, it, it's such a pleasure to, to be here today. It's a really special day, and it's, um, it's an honor to, to be here, particularly um, for, for Shireen. Um, I'm realizing that uh, my vision is such that it's going to be extremely difficult for me to see my slides. So I'm going to do my very best to, um, f to follow them um, as I remember them. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to talk today about improving care for patients at increased risk of hospitalization. And the goal of my talk really is to, is to, to praise um, Shireen, which she doesn't want me to do, um, but, but also really to, more importantly, um, praise the collaboration of, of medicine and university and their role together, which really is the purpose of this day and I think the reason Shireen agreed to let us all come together today. Um, I can't resist just saying one word about Shireen. I, I first met her really as the chair of the PCORI Methodology Committee where she was an extraordinary leader. Um, she really navigated an incredibly complex opportunity to bring science to service in the interest of patients. And um, the more I think about it, the more I realize what wonderful preparation that is for the role, such as leading, leading a university. 
Um, I also can't help but say that uh, on this day, I had the opportunity to do a little bit of um, reading. Um, and some of that reading was about um, Benjamin Rush, who, um, who was the namesake of, of this institution. And then also, um, 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 I, I'm, I really can't see them, um, Brainerd. Um, what is his first name? Daniel Brainerd, who, who was the, the founder of the medical school. And learning about Rush was fascinating. I'm going to assume everyone in the audience knows much of this history. But if you don't, I really urge you to take a look at at least Wikipedia, so technology again. Oh, this will help, actually. Um, and, um, and it's really is an extraordinary man. Um, he, you know, a doctor to um, George Washington, an early abolitionist, although he owned a slave, but, but only one. Um, um, and um, um, a father of modern psychiatry, just a true, true pioneer. And then Brainerd, a fascinating man, who interestingly um, came to Chicago as a doctor, became famous because of his interaction and in infrastructure. It was um, the canals, which were the infrastructure that were part of Chicago, the waterways. And he um, did the first amputation of a leg, which was caused by a canal crush injury, I guess. So um, anyway, extraordinary history. But he had the vision at age 24 to start a medical school. And then that medical school over time has grown into a university. And I think it's that progression from medical school to university, not just multidisciplinary and nursing, but all the other professions that in a way I, I really want to highlight today. So let me um, take a moment and talk about the connection to the University of Chicago, because that's where I come from and where I've spent most of my life. Is it? And it, it's interesting. So, so Rush was founded in, in 1837, as I mentioned. In 1892, it actually affiliated with the University of Chicago. And one fascinating story is that it was on the eve of that affiliation that Rush admitted its first female medical student, because the University of Chicago had been founded as a co-educational um, institution. Now, in 1920, Rush merged with the University of Chicago. In 1942, it unmerged with the University of Chicago. There seems to be very little written about that. I think we'll leave it that way. Um, in 2011, Rush affiliated with the UFC through the CTSA. And I will say that in 2016, we jointly submitted an application. And that collaboration has been extraordinary. And Josh has been great to work with. I also want to um, call out Rod Shaw. I don't know if he's here, but I've worked with him through Capricorn. And what an extraordinary set of examples of physician leaders who really make a difference um, in, in healthcare. So let me turn to the connection of um, my connection to the University and how of Chicago and how the University of Chicago has helped me because I think this helps illustrate why these connections at Rush are so valuable. So my history is the following. My parents took a job at the University of Chicago, each of them in 1968. They moved us to Chicago. I was in nursery school. I enrolled in the laboratory schools where I was taught a love of science, social science, learning by doing, the principles of John Dewey. It's great fun for me. I have a five-year-old daughter who's living the same thing. And I also grew up in the Jackson Park Highlands, a poor neighborhood on the south side. And, and there I saw a real appreciation for the importance of addressing unmet social needs. Now, I came back to Chicago after college um, to get an MD and a PhD in economics. And when I did that, I had three really extraordinary mentors. And I, I want to mention each of them. One was Gary Becker, Nobel Prize winning economist, the most cited economist in the world at the time of his death, um, known for pioneering the application of economics to fields like discrimination. Bob Fogel, also a Nobel Prize winning economist, who, um, who pioneered the application of economic methods to history, studying things like the economics of slavery. And Sherwin Rosen didn't win the Nobel Prize, but an absolute pioneer in the economics of specialization. Well, these guys um, all taught me economics. They taught me to take on big problems, to use these tools. And that's a big reason why after I did my clinical training in the East Coast, I came back to the University of Chicago, returning in medicine and economics and, and public policy. And the central question that drew me then is, 
what is the right degree of specialization in medicine? How specialized should we be? Now, at the time, there were things like the medical outcome study, saying we were too specialized and specialists raised costs and had worse outcomes, but they were based on observational studies with all sorts of biases. And so I began to dig into that problem and want to understand it better. And the way I found the opportunity to do that early on was with the growth of hospitalists, physicians who specialize in inpatient care, with a change in this from the traditional model of primary care physicians who care for patients in and out of the hospital to doctors who did just one or the other. And when this model started, it was hoped that it would lower costs, improve outcomes, um, and people emphasized advantages in patient expertise, presence, but there were also naysayers who said there would be discontinuities, loss of the doctor-patient relationship. Well, over the past 20 years, we have systematically studied this using our students, our hospital, and what is the lesson? Unfortunately, hospitalists are not a game changer. Um, they don't dramatically change outcomes. And this made me wonder why in the world did they grow so quickly if they really weren't better? And what I came to realize is they grew to meet the needs of ambulatory care, not hospital care. It had become too difficult for traditional primary care doctors to spend their um, morning in the hospital seeing their own patients and in the afternoon go off to clinic because they could fill their entire day with primary care patients and only have a few patients ever hospitalized. And so what had happened was over time, ambulatory acuity had fallen. You just simply couldn't make the old job work. We ended up testing this model with empirical data and found that every single theoretical prediction of our model as to why th this having grown for that reason was supported. So we concluded that the old model really wasn't viable. But what was the downside? And the downside was the loss of the doctor-patient relationship. The fact that you no longer have the knowledge and trust and interpersonal communication and relationship that previously had been had with the old model. Now, why does that matter? Well, there's some observational studies suggesting lower costs for Medicare patients if they're cared for longer by their own doctor. There's studies suggesting less futile end-of-life care when there's a longer relationship between the caring doctor. But these are observational studies. There's one randomized trial that is among my favorite studies in all of medicine. And what, it was a study done at the VA in the 1980s. And what it showed was that people cared for by their own doctor, um, uh, sort of the same doctor in every primary care visit, as opposed to completely different doctors in every primary care visit, had 49% lower emergent hospitalizations, 38% lower hospital days, and 74% lower um, um, ICU days. And this really tells me compellingly that there are, that discontinuities are incredibly harmful, especially for these complex patients. And it makes you wonder, is there a practical way to restore this continuity in the doctor-patient relationship? So this is what we've done in our comprehensive care program. Um, and this was funded by um, one of the CMMI awards, as Anish said. And the idea is this, if the problem is that doctors can't care for their own patients in the hospital because they don't have enough patients in the hospital on a daily basis, we risk stratify patients according to their likelihood of hospitalization. And those patients who have low risk of hospitalization, um, they get a primary care doctor, but they're not often hospitalized, and if they get another doctor there, it doesn't matter. The patients at high risk of hospitalization get a doctor who only sees patients at high risk of hospitalization. So they can have a clinic small enough to see those patients in the afternoon and every day be able to be there in the morning to care for them. So that was the idea. We saw all these advantages in terms of continuity of care and knowledge and the ability to internalize savings. Um, but we didn't know whether it would work. And so um, we were able to get this money through CMMI to actually do this. I did this at the University of Chicago. We randomized 2,000 patients over four years. Um, if patients didn't have um, a regular doctor when we got started and they ended up in the control group, we got them a, a new doctor, so at least people had something good to compare them to. And then we studied it over time, looking at patient experience, health outcomes, and resource utilization. Um, a couple of details about the program are here. Um, I'll just highlight the main ones. We focused on patients at high risk of hospitalization, predicted very easily by whether they'd been in the hospital in the past year. We had a tight interdisciplinary team that worked together very closely. Um, we supported the team with data and um, the resources they needed to effectively care for these patients. What did we find at baseline? Absolutely no differences in this randomized trial between the CCP and the control patients. 
Physician ratings start at the 20th percentile nationally in both group. The control group goes to the 80th percentile because we get them a new, new University of Chicago doctor. The intervention group with CCP goes to the 95th percentile and stays there for two years follow up. Um, no difference in general health status ratings, certainly no worse, but no difference. Mental health status, no different at baseline, and then highly significantly um, improved. Um, again, follow up um, here one year, but we followed it further. And then most importantly, in terms of this problem of costs, hospitalizations, identical at baseline, fall by 20 percent and um, um, once for the CCP group, and that is sustained now out to two years effectively. We estimate that the number needed to treat in order for this is four. In other words, enroll four patients for one year, prevent one hospitalization. We're saving about $4,000 per patient per year, which translates literally at a national level to tens of billions of dollars. A variety of limitations of this. We have incomplete claims data. We're trying to do longer follow-up, but the most important is only done at this point in one institution, also a very unique, very socially vulnerable population. So let me sort of begin to bring things together by talking about that component of this. And with folks like David Ansel here, um, um, one uh, is obviously thinking about the incredible social needs of many of the patients we care for, um, both at Rush and at the University of Chicago. We were approached by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation through their Culture of Health initiative to ask, is there more you could be doing for the most vulnerable patients? And we knew that there were about 30% of patients who enrolled in our study saying they were interested and then never made appointments or if they made them, never kept them. So we designed a program with three elements to try to better engage them. First, systematic screening for unmet social needs in 17 different domains. Secondly, access to a community health worker embedded in the program to try to address those needs. And thirdly, access to community-based arts and culture programming to try to activate patients to get engaged in their own care. What did we find when we did this? I'll tell you in a second, but first I want to set up kind of the theory in a way. The idea here is that we start with patients who are high risk, and some are activated to get involved in their cares and others are not. The activated ones do fine as long as we give them access to this program, but the less activated patients just don't engage. So we add these added elements of systematic screening for unmet social needs, community health worker, and this artful living program to try to better activate them. If this theory is right, then what we should see is that the benefits of this program are greatest in the patients who are most vulnerable. Well, when we, um, as we looked at this data and we developed this program, we also did a series of analyses of the patterns of unmet social needs. And what we found is that they were incredibly diverse. The majority of patients had a very, very few unmet needs, but there were clear clusters of needs, issues around children and legal issues, issues around money, issues around healthy living and, um, and engagement with others. But then, critically, one small but incredibly important population where essentially everything was wrong. The, they typically had five to ten unmet needs, and you realized you couldn't refer people to these one-off. You had to approach them in an integrated way. And that had big implications for where we're headed next, which I'll come to in a moment. But let me just tell you about the pilot. Three-armed pilot, randomized trial, Standard care, CCP, and then the C4P intervention with the added social intervention. Completely the same at baseline. What did we find in the pilot? We didn't find a 15 or 20 percent reduction in hospitalization rates. We found a 30 percent reduction in hospitalization rate, even in a 200 person per arm pilot, never powered to show outcomes. Moreover, when we stratified the results, we found that all these benefits were concentrated in the most vulnerable people, exactly the most difficult people to reach. Because what did they really need? What they really need are these relationships. Um, and, and that's what we were able to provide them through this program. I'll also say fascinatingly that the PAM, our measure of patient activation, increased dramatically in this study. But fascinatingly, not with the arts program, but just with the relationship with the doctor. And that's, I think, fascinating. So what are the next steps? We're finishing these analyses. We're doing longer-term follow-up. We're looking at the doctor-patient relationship from a qualitative perspective, end-of-life care. We're looking at unmet social needs and how they develop over time. And we're now launching a phase two study, again funded by RWJ and others, where we've designed clusters of interventions targeted towards these needs I described um, uh, for you. Um, for the, um, um, the child-related group, a dedicated social work um, intervention for um, 
health insurance and financial needs, financial counseling for healthy living and social engagement, a community gardening program, and healthy eating. And then for the many basic needs, what we're calling a social service alignment learning collaborative, where we bring together organizations, and I can't help but think of the similarities with Westside United, to get connect these organizations. One thing that's key is we are doing it in a patient-centered way. There are cases of individual patients de-identified presented in every single meeting that focus on these organizations, what they're all about, and, and what are the barriers they face in doing it. And the key lesson is they are lacking people with whom they can work to build relationships to, in a sustained way, engage these patients. So we're busy spreading this at the University of Chicago from fee-for-service to value-based contracts, including with payers, to our affiliated FQHCs at Ingalls. Outside the University of Chicago, we're working with Vanderbilt and Kaiser and National University Singapore, who've implemented CCP or similar programs. We've run a learning collaborative with support of Medicare. CMS is reviewing a payment model to think about how to support this. And then we're building a not-for-profit organization, what we're calling a Comprehensive Care Institute, to support engagement with other institutions. I'm excited to say one of those organizations we're beginning to work with is Rush, but we've talked with the University of Colorado, Cleveland Clinic, Blue Cross Blue Shield, the United Kingdom's National Health Service, and we're really finding opportunities to spread this um, all around the world. So let me just end with a few kind of concluding thoughts. So it's been 200 years since Benjamin Rush lived and, and the United States became a, a nation. And during that time, we have consistently been a leader in, what's, in transforming what is possible for healthcare. But we've also consistently been a laggard in reaching the frontiers of what is known to be possible. I think the challenge in reaching those new frontiers requires new tools. We don't just need clinics and hospitals as Daniel Brainerd and his students pioneered on the US frontier, or even molecules and genes have been, has have been the focus of the last century, or even apologies in each, uh, computers and data science. The, um, we need a sophisticated, understanding of what health is and how it's produced in the social context in which we live. And I think universities that can train its faculty and trainees to apply these tools can ultimately really serve patients and their communities far better. I think Rush is extraordinarily well positioned to do this. It has the tradition of service, it has the necessity of service for its community, and it has a series of outward looking collaboratory leaders who can really leverage the resources, not just in Chicago, but nationwide and worldwide to do this. So um, I'm excited for this stage at Rush and, and honored to be here. Thank you. My question is relation is related to the likely deficit in the availability of health of physicians in particular moving forward uh, in years to come, particularly in rural and underserved areas. So what are your thoughts about this model as it relates to advanced practice nursing and opportunities for other providers to be engaged in this work? Yeah, so let me just start by saying, um, I run, my primary job is running our division of hospital medicine. I think we actually have the largest hospital-based advanced, uh, advanced practice nurse service um, in the country, probably. Um, so I very much believe advanced practice nurses are, are really important. I also think for some of these patients, their medical complexity is a lot. <laughs> and so I think it's great if doctors can serve this role in many instances, but in collaboration with nurses. And so um, I, I think that there's a lot of primary care that advanced practice nurses are probably far better suited to provide than physicians. I think that where primary care physicians um, are, are constrained, these are some of their most valuable roles, providing this integrated in, inpatient and outpatient care. So um, I see there's lots of opportunity for both to work together. Um, I think that advanced practice nurses could do this job in many settings. Um, I also think that advanced practice nurses can do a number of other jobs um, extremely well that could free up physicians to do more of this. Okay. 
Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Nurses are, nurse practitioners are doing this type of work. They're, they're seeing very complex patients, and they have for well over 35 years, back 40 years when we started. Uh, I'm interested in the work you've done, but have you ever considered or looked at also work with nurse practitioners and doing some comparative work, perhaps? Yeah, so we, again, we, we have engaged nurse practitioners a lot on our inpatient services. Um, we only have five clinicians who do this right now. I would be completely open to having an advanced practice nurse be one of our providers who does this. In fact, we have advanced practice nurses at the University of Chicago who do ambulatory work alone and who do hospital work alone. We just don't have any that do both together. I don't see any reason it couldn't be done. If it were to be done here at Rush, that would be spectacular. <laughs> Our students are going to have a, a lot of opportunities to work in different places for different people uh, and different organizations to provide health care. E everyone from Walmart to Walgreens to CVS to pharmaceutical companies and insurers. Yeah. Uh, what are your comments around how that will influence how health care is delivered and the economics of that health care? Well, um, I'm worried, to be honest. Um, I'm worried about fragmentation. Um, I'm worried about depersonalization that comes from the loss of consistent relationships. Um, I think that um, I think it's it's an opportunity. I, I think that there are times when access needs to be much improved, and I think for some people, those are those are great jobs. Um, I think for others, um, it's very easy for economic forces to, you know, count beans and encounters and visit times. Um, so um, I. I I, I think that there are really important things about defragmenting care in general. I think it's rewarding for the patient, it's rewarding for the provider, and I ultimately believe it's rewarding for the system. But I, I feel there's a whole series of centripetal forces in healthcare, including some of these new payment models that seem like they're very attractive at the surface, but when you dig deeper, they actually create all sorts of problems. And, and so um, I, I, I'm, I'm worried. I think there are some things in the Affordable Care Act that are very exciting, like the idea of the physician-focused payment models and um, things like that that have potential. But I will be honest that to date I've been disappointed by the implementation of many of them. And I feel that um, um, religion um, um, and belief sometimes is trumping reality. And, um, and, and that is, um, it, I think it's something we need to worry about as a country. Excuse me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, you've done wonderful work uh, with the comprehensivist model. And I think I've asked you this question at least a couple of years ago, and I'm not sure you had data yet. Um, it, it's a pretty uh, small panel of patients per uh, comprehensivist. And in, can it be done or scaled? Uh, with uh, current payment models or without grant funding at yeah. this time? So, so it's, it's, it's deceptive. You shouldn't count number of patients, you should count number of RVUs if you must count such things, which we must, right? And the reality is these doctors see just as many encounters as typical primary care doctors and hospitalists. It's basically if you mash together three primary care doctors and three hospitalists and you get six CCPs, their jobs are basically the same. So I would tell you we are making this work at the University of Chicago right now on what's essentially a fee-for-service basis. Our, our estimate is that as a first-order effect, it costs nothing to do this because <laughs> um, it's simply reorganization and that the savings are almost an order of magnitude larger than even the costs of the doctor's time, which in fact is all billable. <laughs> So I, I see very few barriers. We have thought about how to put this in big hospitals, little hospitals, community hospitals, teaching hospitals, non-teaching hospitals, you know, in the U.S., outside the U.S. Um, I really think this is a model that can work in a whole variety of different settings. And that's one of the reasons we're establishing this not-for-profit, to try to really partner with organizations to do that. And that's not to say the work is trivial. Community hospitals turn out to be incredibly complicated organizations. There's a whole lot of cross-subsidization 
innovation and other sorts of things that go on. And once you start to change the system, the funds flow that um, relates to all of that needs to be rethought. But in, fundamentally, this is all about reorganization. And um, in a setting where you have so much opportunity for improvement, there should be more than enough social surplus findable one way or another in order to make that happen. And, and that's the hypothesis that we want to test in essence in our work. Robin. Thank you. Wonderful lecture. Um, I'm so glad you shouted out to the significance of the social service network. It's being talked about more and more and the importance of hospitals partnering with it. But the economist hat, do you think your new not-for-profit will address the under-resourced social service network and think about some potential paying possibilities, CMS with the accountable health communities gave a nod to the social service world, but didn't necessarily spread the revenue. Yeah, it, it's a really complicated problem, and I have a feeling we'll have an even longer conversation about this in questions and answer. Uh, my, my personal feeling about it is that um, we probably spend too little on the social service side of things. Um, there probably are some savings to the health care system from spending more and spending it more wisely. Whether the health care system can internalize those to make it pay, I'm pretty skeptical about. I'm also somewhat skeptical about whether we should be the entity that's doing that. There is a little bit of the problem of sort of putting the fox in charge of the hen house. <laughs> and um, with the way reimbursement models are changing, I think we're going to be the hungry fox for a whole variety of reasons. And that's a really bad group in charge of the hen house. Um, RWJ, which has been, I think, very interested in this sort of work over the past several years, I would say has made a notable shift in the past year away from the idea that the healthcare system can solve unmet social needs towards the idea that the healthcare system needs to be a partner in solving unmet social needs with leadership coming perhaps from outside that. And I think it's quite interesting in what I've heard about Westside United that I think it is a true partnership. It is not a rush led, initiated thing, but a reflection of a broader community. And I think that is um, absolutely right and um, is probably where we're going to need to head as a country. Thank you. Um, I very much enjoyed your presentation. Let me start by that. But I'm reacting to a comment that you said, which was that, um, that advanced practice nurses can free up physicians. Um, that's not, I, I'm responding as a nurse practitioner who actively practices and a professor in, in, uh, in the programs here at Rush University ranked in the top five in the nation. Yeah. I'd like you to understand that the educational model is different of how we educate um, advanced practice nurses versus the medical model that, um, that physicians are educated by, and PAs for that matter. And particularly in the primary care arena, many, 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 many patients choose a nurse practitioner as their primary care provider. So I know your work is within the hospitalist arena, and, and your work is with dealing with very complex patients. But there are many, many, many studies out there to show that outcomes are at least as good among um, nurse practitioners as physicians. No, I, I understand, and I, nothing that I said was meant to imply anything other than that. Let me uh, just explain the perspective of my comment which is that I'm in a world where not that much of that care is provided by advanced practice nurses and where we're trying to figure out ways to free up the time of doctors so that they can go and do some of these other roles. And in that context, it is um, help that we value and um, great opportunities for, for good care. So I didn't mean to imply anything other than that. It's an answerable question with the right kind of research design, so uh, okay. I'm anxious to, to pursue that. Thank okay, you. so thank you very much, Dr. Meltzer, and please help me thank both of our speakers, uh, Dr. Chopra and Dr. Meltzer. We have now a five to seven minute break. Don't go too far because we're gonna move this uh, uh, podium and put some chairs out here. We'll invite uh, four of our leading Rush experts 
uh, to comment on what you've just heard in addition to our two speakers and in the five to seven minutes and with your coffee, think up some, uh, some questions to help us move the discussion. So thank you for your attention and we'll see you in just a little bit. Okay, uh, if everyone can take their seats, we'll, we'll get going. How are we doing for time? I don't see my timer person at the back there. I think we're doing all right. So um, I just wanted to welcome you all, welcome you all back to the, uh, the panel discussion. And this is where we're going to invite four of our Rush leaders. I'll, they're well known to you, so I'll introduce them very briefly. Um, to comment on what we heard from the, pa from the uh, plenary speakers and also invite the plenary speakers to add whatever comments they'd like. But really this is uh, an opportunity, most importantly, for you all to jump into the conversation even a little bit more than you did uh, during the question period. Um, so to my immediate left, uh, Dr. David Ansel. Uh, David is Senior Vice President for Community Health Equity. Uh, at Rush University Medical Center and Associate Provost for Community Affairs at the university. And I think I was whispering to him that I heard his name mentioned, I don't know, sometimes it seemed like uh, every other paragraph by both speakers. Uh, Peter Butler is Chair of Health Systems Management at the College of Health Sciences at the university. Balahota, Chief Analytics Officer, Associate Chief Information Officer, and Associate Chief Medical Officer at Rush University uh, Medical Center, and Renitha Julian, I guess they switched places, but <laughs> you, you could figure out who's who, I bet. Uh, <laughs> Chair of the Department of Women, Children, and Family Nursing in the College of Nursing um, at Rush University, and of course, our, our two esteemed panelists. So what I'm gonna ask our uh, panelists to do for our two ex uh, esteemed speakers, our panelists to do first is for each of them just to take five minutes um, to talk a little bit more about their work, uh, how it pertains to what we just heard, and any reactions, impressions, comments uh, on, what, on, on what they heard. Uh, in particular, what it may mean for Rush. And so some of the discussions that we heard, for example, in the last question period, might lead us to some research involving advanced practice nursing. So I'll just um, stop talking and uh, pass it over to to David Ansel to get us going. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for those really wonderful, stimulating pr presentations. And uh, I just want to reflect on uh, your comments uh, in, in what it stimulated in me. So on the one hand, an Anish, you were talking about the big problem, and let me just, let me frame what I think the big problem is. So the uh, United States has the most expensive healthcare system in the world. It's about 3.8 or $9 billion. So to put that in terms of a world economy, it'd be number fifth in the world, think French, bigger than French fries, the Eiffel Tower, and a good bottle of Bordeaux wine. Think about that, our healthcare. If it, our <coughs> public healthcare economy would be the 17th largest economy in the world. So we spend a lot of money. Uh, and at what uh, how well are we doing? Well, life, we're doing worse among the 10, 11 OECD nations in terms of life expectancy, but even worse than doing the worst, life expectancy in the United States has dropped for three years in a row. Uh, and that's unprecedented. Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, life expectancy dropped in Russia. The last time it happened in the United States, anyone want to guess when that was? 1918, 1919, flu epidemic. So we've never seen this. And the reason why life expectancy is dropping in the United States, economists call for, uh, diseases of despair. So one is the opioid epidemic, but it's not just the opioid epidemic. That's not enough deaths to explain it. It's actually uh, 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 heart disease and cancer deaths. And it's actually the group that's dropping right now the most in this country are white women without college degrees. So what we used to see when we talk about death gaps and life expectancy gaps, and we think the west side of Chicago is actually a big national problem. So not only are we the most expensive health uh, 
care system in the world, uh, we're getting uh, the wrong, the worst results, and it's going in the wrong direction. So I think we can all agree uh, with that. And the problem we're trying to solve is how do you begin to think uh, about making that better? I just want to say a li little bit. So if we, a couple other things about our healthcare system uh, at the large uh, picture level. So if you compare us to all the other 10 OECD nations, I talked about cost, I talked about our outcomes. You know, it turns out that uh, this is not just about hospitalizations. So our hospitalization uh, uh, rates in this country are actually lower. Uh, in about 19% of our health economy is hospitalizations. The rest is uh, ambulatory in other places. So we can fix hospitalizations, and that's really important that we do that and do better at it, but most care is going to be outside the hospital. The other fact is uh, by 2030, about 85 million people will be over the age of 65, and that's going to be more people than are going to be under 18 in this country. I hope to be among them. Uh, but I think the fact is we're going to have an aging population that's going to want to age in place, uh, and we're not even prepared for it. By 2030, it's going to hit us uh, like a ton of bricks, uh, and we're not, uh, we're not uh, prepared for that fact. And if you look at the three major reasons why our costs uh, are more in this country, one is administrative waste, which is totally tied to the design of our system. I think both of you spoke to that. Uh, a little bit. Uh, two is the, uh, the, cost, uh, the cost of goods, meaning uh, everything we purchase and buy. And the third big one is our pharma costs are at least three times the next, uh, next country. So if we want to we solve for this problem, we're going to have to, at the macro level, solve that. Now, in my opinion, uh, Medicare for all is the right approach. There's many different approaches, but we have to have universal health care. Uh, it's got to cover all. And in a universal system, of, whether it's a, a form of Medicare Advantage type, which I, uh, I think is cherry picking right now, uh, so it's cherry picking the healthier patients, but we need an overarching program that covers uh, everybody. I want to end on this note about, uh, in reflecting on um, David's uh, paying homage to the history of medicine. So across the street from us is a park. I, don't, I'm point, I know I'm pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> Pasture Park, that away, right? And in Pasture Park, in about the 1930s, the county docks put a statue up to Louis Pasteur. It's a wonderful statue and has a nice plaque on it. But Louis Pasteur uh, was a quite an amazing uh, human being. Do you know what he discovered? Germ theory. So. From the time of Galen to Louis Pasteur, the prevailing idea of what caused disease were miasmas. Things in the air and exposure to these caused disease. And when Louis Pasteur came up with the germ theory, he was poo-pooed by the medical profession. And what will people say about us when we say we've got this great precision medicine, actually the the latest uh, very expensive drug by the, uh, just approved by the FDA cost $2 million for spinal um, muscular atrophy. It really saves lives. They're going, but what are people going to say about us when if you go down the L track, the blue line, three stops from this, life expectancy is like what it was in the 1950s in this country. And when you look at the causes of death, it's cancer and heart disease. And you showed some data on who's getting flu shots uh, uh, and the like. Think about any medical, there's a 16-year life expectancy gap. We talk about that all the time between the west side and the loop. There's not one drug in the world that can give you 16 years. But imagine if we could address the social conditions uh, that lead to these poor health outcomes. So I think where we are right now is a, is a, a, a national crossroads the political debate about what do we need to do next on health reform is out there. But institutions like Rush and University of Chicago and others are grappling about this interface between traditional medical care, social needs of patients, and the social conditions of our communities. If you take our patients with diabetes and hypertension down the L track, 
those who live in the loop cost one third of those who live in Garfield Park. And there's no m amount of insulin or blood pressure medicine that's going to actually get us to that. Can we do better? Yes. But uh, so I think we're at a moment in time where we're really trying to figure out how do we bring public health back into the delivery system, but also the imperative for health systems like Rush and other businesses in this country to address the overarching inequality gap. I'm going to pass this on to Peter now. Thank you, David. Thank you again, the speaker. So I have a five-prong approach to fixing the health system. You ready? Right, let's go. The vision, it relates to the vision, alignment, simplicity, data, and leadership. So the vision, um, yes, universal health, I'm not a Medicare for all, but uh, Obamacare aimed to get 50 million down to about 15 million. The undocumented wouldn't be covered. We're at 30 million, we've got 15 million more to go. Medicaid expansion through 12 more states, fix the exchanges, uh, and the, the things that, and if you can have everybody with an insurance card coming in the door, it helps to coordinate the care. If you have 30 million out there random, it, it's still very hard to, to get at the, so, we could agree on that vision, I think. Even the Republicans, repeal and replace, why did it fail? Because their vision was repeal and replace, and the CBO says that means 24 million people would lose their insurance. And nobody wanted that. Nobody wanted to go back in that direction. So find a way to get down to at least 15 million uninsured. That's my first point. The second is, uh, relates to alignment. It's already been alluded to, the two worlds of capitated population health versus fee-for-service. And the fee-for-service tug is still enormously strong. So David's model sits a lot better and more aligned in a capitated system than it does in a fee-for-service system. It can work in either, but it gets a lot more logical, easy support in a capitated system. Look at academic medical centers today. We are schizophrenic. All of us say we're going to do more in the community one way or another. Ours is a little bolder vision than some. We're going to improve the health. And guess what? We really need to grow those profitable uh, service lines in selected areas to pay the bills. And the more, the better. So I remember 15 years ago when we uh, presented to the board, we were building our stroke center. And we had this graph that looked like this. And it said, we're number one in stroke. <laughs> and we were celebrating the fact that we had more stroke cases than anybody in the city. And that's kind of a, and it, how great was that? And it, it just kind of is a in your face example of celebrating and treating disease over here while over here. Well, weren't you trying to, in fact, uh, work on high on blood pressure and things like that on the west side? So those tugs are very real and need to be reconciled. And I agree, moving to capitation in the end is the only way to put the allocation of those resources most appropriately and closest to those getting the care. Third is simplicity. Um, so in uh, 1985 or six when I was here as budget director and head of corporate planning, I signed our first managed care contract. I did it, you know, in about 10 minutes. It was about three pages. Okay, I, I was talking to somebody, Tom Deutsch this morning, the Rush Health now is our clinically integrated network. It sits in between those paying the bills and those providing the care. It has 100 FTEs, 100 people to, to coordinate or serve the interface between, between the, and, and the insurers have an equal number, if not more. And still the major incentive of the insurance is how can I pay you less? And the major insurance of our organization is how can we get more? And that's where most of the energy is going and it's not really coordinating care the way we would like, like it to be. At a minimum, we should try to synchronize payers better than we can. I'm not saying single payer, but there's ways to synchronize uh, off of Medicare to Medicaid so that you at least get the, the methodologies in a more limited fashion and, and the systems are aligned in a simpler way so we're all working towards moving towards the population health. The third point, um, that was the third point. Fourth point, data. The fourth data, point. The fourth yeah. point. Da data is great. Um, Anish, I'd say it's overrated, or it, sometimes it's, uh, it's right in front of us and we choose not to act in it. Again, I'll go back to an example when 
One of the highlights of my career was writing uh, some articles with Roger Bone, then chairman of medicine here, and we had just, you know, I was all involved in the development of DRGs in, in Washington. I came here as budget director, and he said, how is it going to impact us? I bet you my, my pulmonary cases on ventilators and I see you are going to lose a lot of money. And sure enough, we, we documented it and published it with our own software, which we later sold, kind of like uh, what has happened more recently here. And we said, my God, 400 patients are going to lose $6 million if they're in the ICU on ventilators. And if you die, you even lose more. We got to do something. It, it created a refinement of the DRGs. It also created our joint venture with McNeil and Loyola for a ventilator unit. It said, man, let's get them out of here. Um, so we never really fully utilized that. And I bet you to this day, we look in our ICUs and they're still clogged up with people on ventilators that probably aren't going to live and have a better setting and are tying up a lot of resources. And we don't need any more data to know that. We need a better way to say, okay, let's have the guts to do something about it and address it. And my last point is leadership, um, which I'm big on. It's easy to talk when you're at the end of your career rather than the beginning, but reflecting on the more need for leaders who think beyond their institutional bottom lines and, and wallets, because if you don't have them coming out of these health systems, who is going to do it? Because all of this requires sometimes sacrificing your own bottom line for a bigger cause. The most notable example I've seen in the last three years or three weeks or so is Northwell, big health system in New York where there's full page ad in the New York Times taken out by Mike Dowling, who said gun violence is a problem, it's affecting health, health care. We as health system leaders need to do something about it. It's a fairly dramatic example of somebody taking on issues that are beyond their institutional bottom line, but we need those voices for sure to kind of move the cultures forward. So there are my five points. Okay, uh, thank you, yeah. So, um, so uh, really nice to be here. Um, and uh, so th I had a couple thoughts, um, and I tend to be very focused on the data as the chief analytics officer here. Um, sort of spend my days focused on um, what data assets do we have, how do we make use of it. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's this concept of digital transformation um, that exists. And if you look up, if you want to look up somebody who's written about it a lot, there's someone named Clayton Christensen who has looked at many different industries and how digital transformation is the story of disruption where you have an incumbent, they have a service, the service is sort of well-matched for the market, but it, over time it has just accrued a lot of waste and, and then the costs of that service go up because there's a lot of overhead. Um, the 100 person example at Rush Health is an example, uh, or any managed care environment where administrative costs in healthcare often dominate um, what we're actually paying for as, as an example. Um, a, a new entrant comes into the market. That new entrant has a new service that's actually very minimal very limited, but it, the patient, the experience of the consumer is better than that of any of the incumbents. And it's at a lower cost because newer technology, newer services, newer models enable that. And then that gets added to over time and pretty soon it has 80, 90% of what consumers in that market actually want at a lower price point. And so people have been saying for 15, 20 years, healthcare is, uh, pr is ripe for digital disruption. The iPhone is an example of digital disruption. When it first came out, it was a phone. Now it's your camera, it's your geolocation device, it has things that you can't even imagine on it. It's, it has all these different services that are bundled. And so I think what people are thinking about is data. How does that enable, and, and how, does, uh, how does it enable choice? How does it enable putting the patient at the center? And then how does that enable that disruption? And, you know, people look, and that's actually why Amazon, that's why Google, that's why Microsoft are all entering this market. That's why there's apps and people are talking about an app economy in healthcare. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's sort of where I think there's a really interesting kind of question. And, and I, 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 but it's not just about data, really. It's about those relationships. Because healthcare, more than any other industry, it is really the relationship of the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the APN, the caregiver and the patient. And so the data isn't the only story. It's really how do we, how do we bring together that relationship? So 
Um, you know, I think that's how we can think about value generation um, in healthcare, and that can inform potentially. If you have the patient at the center, they then have choice. They can, if you can design it, the system in the right way, they can pick the right provider, you can get at the health equity problem and, and, and really solve for that too. So, um, so maybe I'll just stop there. But I think those are sort of the things that are top of mind uh, as we think about it. Thank you. I'd like to start by speaking just a moment to my research, which is focused on supporting fathers who don't live with their children in maintaining consistent and loving relationship across the child's lifetime. Now this work was developed with the full involvement of fathers themselves who fit that target group. And so the piece I'd like to capitalize on in terms of what Bala said was having the patient at the center. So much of the work of nurses is foundational in terms of having the patient, the community, uh, at the center of the work that we're doing. So I'm gonna talk about excellence through innovation, unleashing nursing innovation here at Rush, because we have, and not to brag, one of the top ranked nursing colleges in the country. We have an amazing, We have an amazing group of nurses and practitioners on the clinical side of the street whose excellence is unbeatable as evidenced by their four-time magnet status among other uh, accomplishments. But when you think about innovation, typically that's not something that we get in nursing school that happens in a uh, targeted, thoughtful way in terms of people beginning their practice. So I'd like to ask a question of the audience by show of hands. Who has ever done something in nursing or in healthcare to solve a patient problem at the bedside in the community, sort of using their skills as MacGyver? Oh, yes. Yeah? Right? Everybody knows about MacGyver who was 1985, you know, to the 96 realm and he could take a paper clip and like create magic with it. And I think about nurses. Nurses are born MacGyvers. We do it at the bedside. We do it in the community. We just do it. But on the other hand, what we don't do is take it to the next level in terms of taking that product or that process and moving it to a space where it benefits more than our patient that we're caring for. So these things that we create and that we develop can be spread much more broadly in terms of providing much more comprehensive clinical care on a variety of levels and in a variety of settings. So. Um, the next point that I wanted to make was in thinking about consumer-focused health systems. I believe that these systems, we need to be prepared to focus on, and I think I might have heard David say this term first, wicked health problems. And what are wicked health problems? These are problems that are so complex and so involved that there is no simple solution to them. It's going to require a comprehensive approach that includes physicians, nurses, economists, our data analytics folks, just a wide gamut, politicians, policy analysts, a wide gamut of people in order to come together and be able to solve these social com socially complex issues for example, poverty. How do you solve poverty? I mean, it's a huge, huge issue that takes thinking beyond where we currently are in order to be able to address them. So I'd like to conclude with talking about valuable skills for nursing innovators. Because it's going to require a process change. 
through design thinking, which includes, and I think the nurses in the audience will recognize this as the nursing process, actively engaging with patients, communities, and stakeholders to understand their experiences, clearly defining the patient-focused problems, coming up with alternative solutions to the problems, developing and designing a prototype to solve the problem, and then circling back in terms of evaluation of how we're doing and how we can do better. So this is something I think, as, as I mentioned, you know, in nursing school 101, the nursing process, right? We learned that. So I think um, it's really important that consumer-driven health systems and strategies for innovation include nurses at the table at every level. Thank you. So I'd like to stop there and um, take the opportunity to congratulate Shireen on the eve of her amazing inauguration. We look forward to her presidency as it moves on. And also, I'm really appreciative of being a member of this panel. And I'm excited about where the process of engaging interprofessional innovation can lead us. I'll stop there. So thank, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for getting our uh, discussion going. Um, I'm going to kind of open it up. We've heard a lot from the plenary speakers, but they'll jump in with answers to your questions as well. We'll open it up to the audience for your thoughts, comments, questions, et cetera. I see David's hand is up already. Uh, Dr. Katz, right over here. Oop. Have we run out of these things? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to focus on the university's role in all this really uh, exciting, um, you know, future and present um, innovations. How do you see the role of the university in that in regards to looking at programming, um, whether new programs or current ones, and about how we educate our students to be able to think this way. We're not born thinking this way. So uh, kind of a little bit to give us idea of how you see the role of university in this. So honestly, I think this is for everybody. Um, and um, you know, I don't know, I might pick on Peter first, but, but clearly there's a whole new different set of disciplines that we need to bring to health sciences education, health professions education than we thought about uh, in the past, whether it be nursing or medicine or any, anything in healthcare. So um, I'll maybe, uh, we can pass it around, but I'll maybe start with Peter. Yeah, this is a, um, a tough proposition. When I was honored to give the commencement address a couple of three years ago, I looked at the audience and said there are 800 graduates out there, medical students and nursing students and allied health, each about to go off into their own professions in their own silos. And I said, if I gave you all the money, the capitation money to design the system to serve the 180,000 people that that graduating cohort could handle from a capacity standpoint, I bet you you do it differently than you were just trained. <laughs> I said, we'll go lock you up in a room for a week, you do it totally different, now you're gonna go off. And so we don't create shovel-ready graduates for these models, uh, for sure, it's a real problem. So, Shireen is developing this um, Health Equity Institute concept, and in, in that, I think, includes 
some programs like a master's in health equity that could cross all disciplines that could help create the competencies in selected leaders. And then I think you'll see certificate programs uh, that feed up into this. And then I think all of our own curriculums will get embedded more with these kinds of uh, competencies, it's certainly in health systems management, but that's an easy place to do it. It's harder when you're invading in accreditation processes and expect expectations in other professions. In addition to being a doctor, I'm an epidemiologist, but I think the, f and so I've, data becomes critically important. I want to name three things I think are gonna be important uh, in the future. One is uh, how, uh, how we all interact with data to improve, uh, and that means data skill competencies have to be taught across the disciplines uh, without a doubt. Not so much that you have to be a statistician or be able to do that, you have to be actually to analyze uh, uh, data in a way to execute. Uh, um, the, the second uh, uh, piece of it I think is critically important is there's no, and I think we got this from David's uh, but actually both in Nisha's and David's uh, presentation. This is a team sport. It's no longer can individual professions uh, e uh, exist in silos. We have to work in inter interdisciplinary teams uh, uh, to, do this, to do this work. And, in, and some of those team members are gonna include community-based organizations. They can do it a lot better than, uh, than we can around the, the, the issue of, of social, uh, social needs. So, those are two pieces. I said third, the third thing is there are going to be need for competencies that didn't exist when you train that you're going to have to get. That's not a degree, that's competencies. We've got to figure out ways to actually for academic centers and things like that to be actually trained on that. And I know that we're, we're thinking about those things uh, uh, across uh, the university. Uh, hopefully in the next uh, couple of years we'll be see them uh, see them live uh, in many ways, whether it be in informatics or equity thinking or leadership. Uh, there are uh, stackable uh, competencies and we got to get away from degrees uh, programs as the only way uh, to do this. I just had a quick comment um, with regard to thinking about how we traditionally design curriculum and the work that we do and that we are rightfully so very focused on clinical outcomes and our uh, students being proficient providers, but I think it's going to take some mind shifting in t terms of our academic faculty and our professors in terms of making space for this work in our curriculum. Just one, one comment before we move to the next. At the national level, uh, research and development uh, is a critical role that universities play. And in the healthcare delivery system of the future, the marriage of more research in an applied way through some form of proof of concept center is a new muscle that we've introduced into the uh, healthcare uh, vernacular. The creation of PCORI, and the uh, uh, concept run, uh, proof of concept centers, and any, anyone receiving grant funding from the NIH under a certain category can instantly request for spot funds to translate those ideas into practice. So I do think there is a new muscle that we're trying to get universities as a country to adopt, to take their ideas focused on the problems at hand, all of which were well articulated, but then to come up with mechanisms to translate them to society faster and that, that particular muscle of uh, a proof of concept center is a new, con new construct that I think could help bring to life some of the uh, challenges that we just uh, heard. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, David. so um, I have a, a ton of thoughts about this since I'm gonna have to control myself, but um, I, I think that there are a, an incredible range of opportunities to enhance education to address these needs. So uh, to give you an idea of some of the things we've done, and I, it, they didn't begin in this order, but it's easiest to organize this way. We've started as early as high school kids. 
taking honors minority high school kids from the Chicago Public Schools, bringing them into our environment to train them and prepare them for diverse careers in, in the healthcare sector. At the undergraduate level, we've engaged undergraduates from any Chicago institution in our research and helped train them and prepare them and think about clinical research. Um, at the, uh, um, at the um, at the medical school level, we've run an MD-PhD program in the social sciences where we train people with degrees in the social sciences to do this. As we've moved into the faculty development level, we've thought differently about this. Also interdisciplinary training, but recognizing that the economics of that investment are very poor from the institutional perspective. So we have to design sustainable programs that um, keep themselves moving over time. We leverage NIH support where we can, and then um, programs for adults. Adults, um, both professional and, and non-professional, get them the ability. So I, I think there are immense opportunities from high school students, if not younger, to senior citizens to engage people in addressing these problems that can be huge win-wins. And one thing I'm super excited is that the AmeriCorps program that we started a couple of years ago is now coming over here to Rush as well, and it's an opportunity for us to collaborate. So I think we can really um, do a lot together in this space throughout the age spectrum. Yeah. I mean, just as with the comments around advanced practice nursing, these comments, I was leaning over to, to David, um, many of the things you're working on, we're working on as well. I mean, we have relationships with the high schools and we're reaching, we're reaching into those communities. So we need to get together and, uh, you know, maybe we can collectively move forward, m move forward faster than each of us uh, alone. Um, I, I might just pick on Ranga, if I, if I may. <laughs> um, just yesterday, we, uh, you and I were talking, as, as two uh, chemistry undergrad majors, right, we were talking about um, the importance of incorporating quantitative skills, math skills, in, in data anal an anal analysis skills in medical school, perhaps in place of, you know, the, the chemistry that we know and love. Do you want to maybe comment on that since we were just talking about it? You caught me while I was doing something else, but uh, can oh, okay, you hear me okay? Whatever. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. So I think what we are talking about is skills from schools to colleges to medical schools to healthcare professions, nursing. We're actually in a world full of data, but we have no idea what it really means. It's, data is all over the place. The problem is how do you use it, how do you not use it, and how do you not get fooled by it? And every single minute, every single one of us is fooled by it. And that is partly because there are three elements that we don't teach. We teach how to add, how to multiply, all in school. Important skills, but no longer something you use throughout life. You can do it far better with bigger numbers right on your cell phone. But all our energy goes towards simple math. What we haven't done is computational thinking. And uh, there is a whole movement towards that, but nothing in the US, which is so striking to me. Because right. I work with uh, Asian governments who actually wrote, used to be all rote thinking. They're moving towards computational thinking. Um, and computational thinking has only three things that you need to learn. One is, how do you ask the right question? That's actually the hardest thing to do. The second one is where could you find the right data, which is not easy either, and which I think Anish talks about. As you open data up, data still has significant flaws in it, including every data that we can access. Knowing the limits of it is critical because it can mislead thinking, decisions, and analysis. Uh, you don't need to think very far. You can think of the first Iraq war or second war or whatever. Every one of them has had flaws in thinking based on thinking that numbers mean more accurate. The third part, which is actually the one that everybody has to learn, is how to use something that is given to you. How to actually turn it and understand it. And that all those skills we don't teach, there are, there are formal courses to teach it. It's being utilized right now in middle schools, but it is not part of the US okay. education system. So we were talking about maybe consider introducing it for our students. Because in medicine, we somehow <coughs> don't seem to think that math is important. It isn't math, 
It's a fact is you live in data, you use data, and you make decisions. And so somehow we've got to get that in. Um, there are a couple of courses which are online that we're planning to think how to adapt it. It's going to take a little more time because we already overload students with a lot of things that we do. And most of it is still memory-based and not really connected to the real world of what you have to do when you enter the world of so, so the notion is including data as a central capability, central competency in uh, our health sciences education. Um, and oftentimes you ha it has to take the place of something and, you know, we're even just th talking about, you know, do we need as much basic science? We certainly need more data science. And, you know, data science is a very growing, is a big and growing field uh, nationally. Bala? Yeah, I, and just to, just to react, I couldn't agree more. Um, just from the standpoint, w I could work continuously from now for the next five years on the problems that we have potentially available to be solved with data. Um, but in terms of growing the team, these are hard, hard skills to find in, in the job market. It, it's, uh, and what, I mean, what are you looking for? You're looking for somebody who can, just like Ranga said, um, and a couple of, of the folks here, um, uh, frame the problem. What is it we're trying to solve? And in an analytical way, uh, how do we solve it? And then um, have rigor around the way you then take that and analyze it. Um, in healthcare, it's really challenging to find that combination. You, you can find people who can know the business side or know the clinical side. You can find people who then um, know how to you know, uh, create a database, analyze a database. Most of the time that's actually spent in solving these problems is getting those people to talk the same language. And so the, the amount you could accelerate with, with really that, that combination of skills, it's a 10x you know, kind of an acceleration. Uh, and so um, it's a unique opportunity. I mean, so I've been hearing now for computer science degrees, it's not just computer science, but it's computer science plus. What's the other skill that you've been trained in in addition to that? Um, and so, uh, and that's only gonna compound. I mean, the rate of growth of data in healthcare is exponential. And then if we have open data, you know, Anish was key in this information blocking legislation. Um, Shafiq has been leading the way, uh, Dr. Rob in leading the way in terms of actually implementation and getting the data to be available like we heard about. If all that data is available, who's gonna make it understandable and actually augment the clinical, clinical judgment to make it useful for patients? Um, and we just don't have the, the personnel in the United States right now. How do we, I mean, uh, I'll maybe ask you folks to comment a little bit more, uh, more about that. There's data science programs, and if you've seen one, you've seen one. They're all over the map. What does that actually look like, uh, preparing the next generation to make data actionable, to be able to understand it, to not fall into the traps, uh, as Ranga said, that we fall into e every day with data? What, is, what does a curriculum like that look like? Yeah, I think uh, I'll come, but David, I think, has some thoughts on this, too. Um, uh, you know, back in the day, these were epidemiologists, uh, you know, uh, people who know how to manage data sets and then do the analysis to give a result, give information. And uh, that's, I, I think that still applies. It's, you, it's not just somebody who knows how to run a statistical model. It's somebody who can make sense and tell the story, really. Yep. And so I just want to, you know, I, I, I credentialed myself as an epidemiologist, uh, but you get one point in the world for pointing out the problem and 100 points for solving it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, most of the time, we're yeah. focused on one pointers. Yeah. Uh, and so, and this is now for, to Rango's point, but also th thinking about David and uh, his work. You know, there are a lot of things coming our way. We are very low margin, high cost system. And, uh, and as I mentioned, there's a high degree of social need that's coming our way when we screen our patients at about 30% positive on some sort of social need at the lowest and at the highest is 40 and we're not, a, I'm sure at Stroger County Hospital, it's you know 90%. So the question is how do we begin to think about what interventions make a difference from a quality and a cost uh, and an experience perspective? And we need to train, we need to train uh, our students on real-time problems uh, from which we can then decide whether we do something or not do it. Your program is a great example. We had a, a program of identifying uninsured patients who are in our hospital and then referring them to a free clinic 
using a navigation program and something called NowPow, developed out of the University of Chicago, Knowledge is Power. I would call it a social service integration program. And what we found, it was a, a student in Peter's department who did this as her master's project, and it was a trial to show, did this sort of closed loop referral make a difference in 30 day readmissions to us? And yes, it did, in 90 day uh, readmissions. Trisha Johnson's in the back there. It was, she uh, uh, supervised the student in this. But it allowed us to know that this uh, deployment of resources was worthwhile. But to come out of medical school or health science management or nursing skills with that kind of execution uh, set to skills around the problems of our day doesn't really exist in a widespread way now. And I think those are the skills that, that people need, uh, whether it be randomized trials or other forms of ability to lever data and research. So um, some of my very best friends at the University of Chicago are the administrators of educational programs. And the reason that they are some of my best friends is that um, we've developed relationships with them where they will send their students to us for internships. And we become the training ground for the student. We benefit from them. We get to know what they're doing. If they're really great, we try to encourage them to stay. <laughs> um, and I think that that sort of model, which you guys just referred to, I think that that needs to be elevated, um, understood as an institutional priority that when we decide who we admit to our schools, when we decide how we create financial aid, when we think about how we reward faculty for teaching, what teaching even means, you know, in a world where there's such great stuff online. If we changed our incentive structure to recognize that that sort of human capital creation is really valuable for the students and for us, we could have a very different world where, in fact, you would get labor so much faster and you'd be able to retain people who were trained to know your environment and succeed in it. I just want to drill down a little more on David's original question. Um, uh, and this has been time well spent. If I kept a diary, I would write that. Um, I'm a basic scientist here. I direct the anatomy laboratory. So this is more for the clinicians. Uh, as you look at what you've been talking about, specifically, what do you have to say with respect to how we go about teaching the basic sciences? Should we, um, my, my discipline takes a large footprint of time. Should we have a different way of approaching it? There's no lecture that's not already online. Um, should we make uh, students show proficiency in anatomy before we even accept them into one of our programs? Can you give us some specific, and you definitely wouldn't offend me if you said anatomy is not important. I just wouldn't believe you. Um, but it's wasted on medical students. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, you know, you never appreciate the importance of physiology or anatomy until you're dealing with the problems. And I think one of the big movements in clinical teaching has been to integrate the basic sciences into the clinical sciences. And I think that's true in the medical school curriculum, but it's far less true in residency. And I wonder whether we might do more on that spectrum to think about how to take these incredibly important basic sciences idea and integrate them through a longer period of the training in moments when, when people see the real relevance of it. I mean, adult learning theory is about um, understanding the, Im the importance of information in the context in which you use it. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that if you can integrate basic science into these opportunities when people are using it, it's, it's going to be that much more impactful. Um, I'll also just say, um, I, I was a double major in college in economics and molecular biophysics and biochemistry. I loved learning about the basic science, but what I really loved were the experiments and the ways of thinking about asking questions. And, and so I, I wish that more of basic science for medical students continued to reinforce that idea of asking questions and um, figuring out how to <coughs> instill curiosity about basic science and the tools for answering basic science questions 
We have an incredible crisis in this country in terms of um, um, investigators in basic science and, and, and particularly clinical investigation. And figuring out ways to invest resources in keeping people who are going down clinical paths being interested and engaged in that process is, is a desperate need. So I, I think that the basic science is really important. I think we should think more about novel ways to integrate it at different stages. Um, our residency programs are doing that. Or, uh, ortho, ENT, uh, everybody but it's psychiatry. And our nurses uh, in their uh, advanced education are coming back to the lab. But it's the others we worry about. Josh? So thank you guys for being here. Um, I just wanted to sort of follow up on um, Dr. Katz's question and sort of what uh, Dr. Ansel started the conversation about, about Louis Pasteur. So as a microbiologist, I can certainly appreciate your story. Um, and based on the backgrounds of everyone on the panel, it's obvious why healthcare is huge, the big picture. But not all of us are going to be clinical practitioners. And so at an academic medical center, one of the strengths that you have is your graduate students, your graduate faculty. Those are the ones that teach critical and analytical thinking skills. And so while I can understand the importance of teaching medical students how to think critically and analytically, I really would like to hear sort of how you integrate basic science students and educators in this big picture. Uh. I, I don't know if I can answer your question, but I will just want to say a couple of thoughts. You know, if you look at, as I think about sort of the health gaps that we see, uh, and some of them seem to be linked uh, to places in particular, uh, as a doctor who's practiced on, say, the West Side for 40 years, I was really struck by the degree of uh, disease burden that my patients had. And I do think there's problems, is understanding that interface between, I call it the social, the biome, and the genome. That's a critical area of understanding and research that we have. Uh, I'm, you're a microbiologist. I'll take you back to the 1956 polio epidemic in Chicago, JAMA article back then on it. And uh, so polio in an, in an unvaccinated population, you know, everyone is potentially at risk, but like everything else we've seen, black children were disproportionately at risk. So understanding how those interactions occur is, I think, critical to our thinking of solving some of these problems. Uh, so, uh, you know, I do think that that uh, has a role in basic science training as well. And so where are areas of translational research where we can actually begin to think about how do you make difference in these, uh, these things? What's driving it? Just to, before you, sorry, Dr. Ahead, Gabriel. To follow, to sort of piggyback on what you said about black children being at risk, that was uh, sort of a second question that I had but didn't ask. And that is, you know, when you talk about zip codes determining um, morbidity, mortality in uh, certain populations, that is likely due to the lack of representation of those very same communities in the clinic and in basic science. And so, you know, while you can address the problem through uh, critical and analytical thinking, through analyzing data, um, one of the things that I think has not been mentioned today is representation and diversity. I mean, not to criticize the panel, but just looking at the panel, we have one nurse, a lot of physicians, you all do research. I don't see any basic scientists or, you know, I see one person of color, I think. And so, you know, just the representation in terms of the research, um, practice in the clinic is also incredibly linked to some of the um, outcomes that you see. So, so I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. That's important. Um, and we're going to have many more of these sessions with uh, different kinds of panels and different kinds of topics. So, so stay tuned for that. 
but I think to your first point, the integration piece is really critical. I mean, that's something that we consider a central tenet of who we are at Rush, is we're integrated. We're health, health sciences university with four colleges um, that ought to be working together. And I say ought to be because we're not there yet. And I am actually going to pick on Dean Bean a little bit to get his thoughts on, on how how we integrate the basic sciences with the uh, with the the work that's going on in the other colleges to make sure that that analytical thinking th th that belongs to all of us that's not that's not just one discipline it's not just about one discipline but uh, uh, you're absolutely right we need to move forward with that integration uh, in our education programs in our research programs and the way to do that is to educate together to do research together, to learn together, and as we uh, recruit students and faculty and staff to think about diversity and inclusion. It's, it's just a different way of, of teaching. We have, uh, or a different kind of model. Basic science uh, is, a, is a kind of a guild model these days, right? You go into a laboratory, you learn critical and analytical thinking by focusing on a small problem and digging into it very deeply. Um, it's a different model than in medical school training or nursing or uh, he allied health. And uh, what we focus on and what graduate students focus on is critical and analytical thinking. And that's their focus entirely, how to do that. In fact, a lot of graduate schools in their first year have a course on critical and analytical thinking. How do you problem solve? And that's why graduate students come out and they have a variety of different careers. They, they are not trained to just go see patients. They're, they're consultants, they're patent lawyers, they're, they run the gamut of careers. And that's why most graduate schools have career development offices. Because we're not training people to do one thing. Their project is a proxy for learning problem solving and critical thinking. And it's not really present, uh, or, or it's, it's present in small batches in uh, the other colleges, in the other types of, right. of schools, but, clinical but, training. But, I mean, that's what I was trying to say. Maybe we don't have to go far to find expertise in how to educate people in clinical and in, in analytic thinking. And I think that was, that was your point. Right. And it's, it's actually kind of a shame that we're scratching our heads over here in two of the colleges when one of the colleges sort of uh, you know, does this every day. I'm so, there with you. Um, integration is what we're all about, but we need to do more of it. Uh, Josh. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, terrific panel. Uh, Dr. Chopra, I think I'm an adherent to your religion, if I understand it, <laughs> which is in order to bend the cost curve, we don't necessarily want to ration or just simply decrease reimbursement. So we want to spend our money more wisely to improve the healthcare system through research and discovery, if I heard you correctly. So in order to get there, how do we get there through research and discovery? Uh, one of the ways we do that is we have every stakeholder in the healthcare system participate in research. And that's actually one of our major goals in our Institute of Translational Medicine and our CTSA grant with UChicago and other institutions around the city. That's to create a new normal where all participants, the patients, um, primary care providers, uh, specialists, administrators, etc., participate in the healthcare uh, research system, either passively by just allowing them to use their data or actively by participating in clinical trials. Because we're only going to get there uh, and have the data we need if everyone participates. I wonder if you'd comment on that, and maybe David, you can also talk about the New Normal campaign from your perspective. Uh, thanks for the question. And I'll I want to go back to Peter's comment, which is whatever you described a decade ago, the data on the, ventri you know, the, uh, the ventilators were not needed and, and there was not a lack of action. The reason I called for the Team B is the following, and, and let's tie that back to the research and discovery aspect. Uh, if at the end of today's lecture, the question's asked, how many patients living in Chicago of Medicare age that qualify for Dr. Meltzer's program? Tomorrow morning, how many of them are going to be encouraged to call his clinic for an appointment? Okay, just a third less admissions, much better care. How many of us have loved ones who are living in Chicago who are of age that could qualify? What action 
in the system today will connect the people who live here that could physically go into his clinic to call and ask. My presumption right now is back to the issue of the data doesn't really do anything where Peter was, is that there isn't an organizational structure, what I'll call Team B, that is hunting for this. Hunting for this. So someone is going to be the CEO of Team B to think about the people of West Chicago, if that's the model with David, or broadly speaking, the city or wherever, and say that group desperately wants research and discovery to figure out what are all the Meltzer ideas that are being developed. His is more refined, had research funding to demonstrate results, so that's put that higher on the maturity scale. But there's a lot of just anecdotal, this guy does ECMO and whatever Omar was describing about you've got the expert here. In theory, if there was a team B outside of the traditional system, they would have a roadmap that would lead from discovery uh, and research to figure out what should be done to rapid testing to scaling and maturing what works. The diabetes prevention program that the actuary said has a four to one ROI, every single doctor treating a Medicare patient could prescribe it. What percentage of the eligible population in the year and a half since that's been available got a prescription from their doctor? Less than 1%. The headline in JAMA for an editorial about the care transition program, which demonstrates 10% reduction in costs and a double digit reduction in expected mortality. The headline was better care, lower cost, and rarely used. At the time they published it, less than 7% of the Medicare population had access to that service. So, so the research and discovery in a Team A world, pouring more money onto the research and discovery for Team A, will get us a completely different set of research questions than if there was an organizational frame for Team B. And I love MacGyver. And I'd put a nurse in charge of Team B. <laughs> and I would say, what I who is the advocate for the system that optimizes for the families in Chicago you care so deeply about. In the world of today, where uh, David finds the Breast Cancer Center of Excellence and says that they don't, they're not physically located in the, in the poor areas, who's paying for the Uber Lyft transport to get the folks to the right place to get screened appropriately, to get the highest quality, to get the result? And how are we measuring that? That's research and discovery. Should we run that trial? The democratization of payment models and the democratization of data means that one need not be at an academic institution exclusively to run to research and discovery. Any frontline worker in any port of the region that has a loved one, has an N of one, I want to run an experiment. Who are patients like my grandma? And how are the best of those patients getting care? And is there a way for me to follow that path? That's the tension. If we don't have someone thinking about that all the time, I'm not so sure the existing model will optimize. That's, that's the tension of the need for Team B and a boatload of research benefiting if there was a person driving that agenda. That was beautiful. <laughs> it, it was, so and I think it gets at the difference between what I think about as population health, which you just described, and what we're faced with as the people call population health, which they call value-based care, which take your heart failure patients and make them do something, you know. And I, I actually, and that, re that requires you to be, you know, at least geographic-centric yes. or uh, neighborhood-centric, we'll call it geography, geographically-centric, payer-agnostic yes. and institution-agnostic. I call that real pop health. Now, the incentives are not lined like that at all. Uh, but I do think that that's, that is exactly the work that needs to be done. Uh, and it's got to be across all payers because uh, my Medicaid patients who are 59 years old probably have a three or four year life expectancy, some of, some of my patients. They'll never get to Medicare. But we've got to think about that, uh, that process. And, how do we do it? The question back to you is now, you're right, you're correct, it aligns because it's exactly what I think, so you must be correct. <laughs> but uh, 
uh, how do we how do we afford to do that now? Yeah, so th let me just quickly take this basic principle. The cost of running that advocacy program has fallen precipitously on account of the innovation economy. So let me just, let's make that really simple for right now. In theory, under the current rules, every government-sponsored plan, Medicaid, Medicaid Managed Care, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, qualified health plan. In the city of Chicago, that's going to be half the lives-ish. By this time next year, every one of those insurance plans must, not should, must take all the claims data that's sitting in their proprietary systems and give it to that consumer app. By the way, the one that you've already built, okay? So just let's say for the sake of discussion, we're going to put Omar on the spot. Uh, say Rush, help, Rush bequeaths to this Team B free access to this app. Just no cost. It's okay. We're going to pull all this in. Now, someone in Bala's team could work with uh, Meltzer and others and say, hey, let's inventory all the existing ideas that we know. Just all the screenings. A person that has this background would be a great candidate for Dr. Meltzer's thing, a great candidate for this new thing. The nursing team's going to come up with an advanced practitioner version of this thing. We're going to have 20 of these things listed. Okay? Again, no funding, no new insurance vehicle. We haven't changed the federal law. Of, uh, is no Affordable Care Act 3.0. We, it's just information in the hands of someone who cares to advocate for the folks in charge. In theory, you could screen lots of folks to say, you'd be a great candidate for this clinic, that program, this thing, and let's try. That is not an expensive thing to start up in this new world. It would be massively complicated to start a whole new insurance company and start all that. That's a whole, that's a ball of wax that's team A. But the Team B startup costs are really low. And there aren't a lot of folks building Team B experiments back to research and discovery. But the good news is the cost to launch it is very, very light in a world where we're not fighting and clamoring for the basics of this, this circumstance. And my sense is you don't solve every problem tomorrow, but there's a library of really good things that can be identified just from best practice in the city of Chicago you know, it's not like nobody's getting great care. People are getting great care in pockets. You just got to route folks to the folks that are giving them the great care. It can be done, but again, it's more mental block in prohibiting us to launch Team B than a massive check to underwrite Team B. My opinion. So a comment I'd have on Team B is that the launch, I agree totally, uh, not that expensive. Some people may take advantage of it. Let's focus on Medicare, and I mentioned synchronized payer, because if you can demonstrate it in Medicare, you can maybe spread it elsewhere. But 87%, um, I think, or so, of Medicare beneficiaries basically have first dollar coverage, either as a dual eligible or through employer base or, or Medigap. So they're really only about 13% of the Medicare population that has no financial incentive whatsoever to to limit their choices, except at Medicare Advantage, where they get some sweet deals. Yeah. So how, and we already addressed how shared decision-making incentives haven't quite gotten up. So how are you going to engage financially? Because there you will get tractions. If there's a penalty or a bonus for executing on Plan B, you're going to get real traction. How do you do that? Yeah, this is fun. So it's just <laughs> So, so he, guys, here, let me just share some experiments. The, the U.S. government ran an experiment on uh, poor kids to go to college through better information. The idea was we'd simplify the, free, uh, the financial aid forms FAFSA. And in theory, if we simplified the FAFSA, more folks would apply, more financial aid, more access. Wonderful idea. We saw some bump. Without any revenue model, without any uh, change, we allowed H&R Block and others to act as fiduciaries, extensions of the family. And just allowing H&R Block to pre-populate the FAFSA and submit doubled the number of kids that not only got the FAFSA completed, got financial aid, went to school, and finished. The, ratio, the ROI to society was we didn't do anything to H&R Block, just more information, but empowered them to do the service, and that their, their customer base flipped. Now, 
That's a bit of a dream is scenario where there's no need to fund the Team B. But it is an example where there are the, the expectations of financial reward may not need to be so high. Look, when the country went from pension plan to 401k, the idea was democratize access to information, allow folks that otherwise have this complicated financial wizardry in front of them, and an army of people stood up and said, we'll create a model to support you. They became effectively your financial uh, fiduciary, the 401k vanguards and all them. And the point is people, a whole new model emerged. This is the debate, which is, uh, will there be a health information fiduciary? And uh, look, what's happening with Walmart in uh, Dallas, Georgia? What's going to happen when Amazon and Google engage? The reality is we're going to see some of this experimentation in a pure digital form. That's not going to cut it in the Ansel model. It's going to have to be married with a human being that talks to a human being and engage. And maybe there will be a, a synthesis of big tech plus social engagement. And the combination allows Team B to launch without a huge revenue model. No one paid you a check to deliver this service, but we're doing it for the reasons. Uh, it may be that that may be the, the catalytic effect. Uh, the beauty of where we are right now is the need is so great, someone should do it, right? Someone should stand up and make it happen. And there's energy and a lot of capital flowing, and we'll see, we'll see the economic models emerge. But will, will that come from the system, from the universities attached to the system? outside of the system. The leadership question of the day is, will, w what role will your institution play in nurturing said teams whenever they emerge? Um, I'd like to respond to the question from a member of our audience who, more of a comment from our, our audience member that spoke to the issue of diversity. And with the question of who's going to get people where they need to be to be engaged in Team B. The more we have healthcare practitioners who look like the patients and the communities that we're trying to help, the easier that work will be in terms of uh, building a sense of trust, a sense of community, and that's going to help people move into those spaces where they can benefit from this work. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, it's kind of mirrored on a synthesis of all the questions that were asked today. So um, there's not one person on this panel that is the end user. I mean, we all use healthcare, but, but in the topics we're discussing, disparity and that. So um, I am a big believer that if you listen to people long enough, they're gonna tell you what they want or what they need. And so um, currently we do patient satisfaction surveys after the patient has left the hospital and had some time to think or forget exactly what their treatment was. Um, I actually was a patient in Rush um, a number of years ago for all total 50 days um, in one year's time. And I had 150 people take care of me because I wrote them down and I wrote down what they did and I sent Larry Goodman a seven page letter um, and there was one person I didn't like and she was the person that I needed the most, the ostomy nurse. And um, the person who taught me most about how to deal with my ostomy was an EVS worker whose child had one. Um, so um, I say that just to say that you don't always have to have a degree or letters after your name to know, um, how to be able to identify the problem, to come up with a common sense solution because people in neighborhoods where they don't have access to healthcare, um, they come up with ways of fixing themselves. They come up with ways of supporting themselves. So um, uh, just, uh, I, I've had a lot of experiences where bosses have made decisions and that I have to implement and they never asked me what I thought about it. So, um, Maybe some of the, the research that we need to do is to go out into the communities, like Renita was saying, and talk to um, the consumers of it before we put all of these great plans into place and tell them what they need from us. Maybe we should go out and ask them what they need from us in order to implement the solutions and make them practical ones that work for them because you can say yes these are the best doctors but like you were saying the uber if they're if you're on the north side and the doctor is on the south side and you can't get to him um, it's it's not going to do you any good so maybe it's not having all of the best doctors aggregated in one area but spreading them across and maybe sharing them between um, 
academic institutions and hospitals. Yeah. I, mean, I can just echo what the importance of what you said. I think we probably all of us agree with this and have seen the, both the problems you describe as well as sometimes bright points in, in solving some of these things. PCORI was created um, very much with this mindset of trying to engage patients in all parts of the, the process. And I'll just share that the program that I described to you has from the very beginning engaged patients in absolutely every way from um, talking with patients in the first days of even conceptualizing it to actually operating it and making executive decisions all the way through. Um, that's not the way all clinical programs are run, but it's the way this one has been run, and I couldn't imagine it having been successful without that because our patients regularly bring knowledge and expertise that makes the program better and more responsive to the diversity. I'll also just say that one of the amazing things for me um, has been um, not just um, having patient advocates or community leaders, but actual real patients. Um, people whose qualification for being there is that they're ill. <laughs> and um, that message is an incredibly important one. It keeps everyone honest. I just wanted to underscore the point about PCORI, the whole reason for its existence. And when uh, David and I worked on the methodology committee there, um, we ensured that every single phase of the research process was not just informed by patients, but directed by patients. So uh, they attended every patients attended every board meeting. The research question came from what we heard from patients. The research design came from what made sense in order to gather the kind of data that meant more to patients, all the way to, you know, um, disseminating the results. Well, how, how should these results be disseminated? We had patients on, on review committees uh, to figure out which, which grants, which applications got funded. So um, we're, we've kind of uh, drunk the Kool-Aid totally on that. Um, as David said, not every single clinical research uh, uh, project and enterprises works that way, but I think it's absolutely critical because we, we miss the boat. I'm, I'm a rheumatologist. I'll just give you one small example from my world. Um, when we started, before we did that, a lot of the research funding in, in rheumatology, and much of it's useful, was uh, uh, basic science and focused on understanding, you know, what this molecule does and what this pathway does. And when we started talking to patients, they said things like, the most important thing for us is fatigue. Study that and how to treat that better. And that's the kind of aha moment that you get when you engage patients. Yeah, I just want to add something for, uh, with respect to the data and sort of some of the aspects there. Uh, um, and, and, you know, it, Right now, you could argue the way we're set up to study these things and sort of the group A that Anish was talking about, there's really gatekeepers to it. The topics we look at, even the ways that we construct what the grants are that are going to get funded, all of that comes from people who are in this business of studying, of academia. Um, the federal grant agenda dictates a lot of what people study. But if you have open data where patients get get the data themselves, and then give permission to other entities to use their data, it flips a model on its head. Because you really do empower individuals to share their data and decide what are the things worth studying. I think the other sort of thing that's a subtext here, and I think it's becoming more prominent, is the notion of privacy and ethics and data use, and who owns the data. Right now, uh, nationally, we're in this model where data is viewed as liquid gold, it's commercializable, and there's this race to aggregate data and have these data sets that are for sale. Um, open data could potentially flip that too and have the patient in control of the data and its use, its provenance or where it comes from and who can use it. And so, um, so while there's been some, you know, like uh, cer certain um, stakeholders will say that open data or, or opening up the data has privacy concerns, it's actually a better situation in a way than right now where I don't know who has my data or what it's being used for, especially healthcare data. So, um, so that's just the one thing. So that ethics and the use of data and, and sort of leveling the playing field 
uh, I think is very promising in this kind of a model where the data can be um, put in the power, put in the hands of the individual. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Did you have a question? Asked and answered. Okay. Any other questions out there? Oh, there's one up front here. Most of the discussion centered on what the medical system might do uh, and how we might change that curve. But of course, um, preventive medicine is attra attracted to do just that from the start without getting into the medical system. And that is uh, a fair number of conditions, diseases, are result of the behavior that we each choose to, whether it's how much we eat and what we eat and how much exercise, all of these things that are have a dramatic impact on our well-being. And I haven't heard that addressed as much in this group, where it's mostly going to be resolved by folks who are uh, in a hospital, uh, when in fact uh, that large population that's out there will have more influence on their well-being than anything that happens in our hospitals and our doctor's offices. What happened to preventive medicine? And obviously, uh, blood pressure control and exercise that, and walking on the west side and those things that are part of the programs to help change these neighborhoods. But should that not be the central part of what we're talking about? And that is preventive medicine, which will have much more impact on all of the health conditions that we're addressing, as opposed to the tip of the iceberg when they're in the intensive care unit and we could spend an incredible amount of money. Just to fiercely agree with you, I actually, uh, you know, health does not arise out of a health care system. We really are a sick care system. When I said we need to marry what we do with public health, it was getting to actually what the root causes are of uh, health, you know, poor health outcomes. And I, uh, and we, you know, this issue of equity has come up a couple times in this conversation in different ways. And in this country in particular, structural racism, uh, the way that uh, historic uh, and current uh, practices uh, keep people uh, ill uh, or, uh, you know, promote illness, premature uh, mortality are critical uh, uh, for those of us in healthcare systems to understand that the drivers are poor health. You, you, you can't tell some people just eat better if there are not stores in their neighborhoods or they can't afford the stores or walk more if you can't walk in the park. And so this becomes one of the pieces that we have to do. It's not just beliefs and behaviors, it's actually uh, conditions. I, I want to speak to this issue of representation as well. I think for the university to survive uh, into the future and uh, it's going to have to be much more inclusive and I know as part of our diversity inclusion uh, planning here, we've made demographic parity uh, actually as a goal. Uh, so demographic parity, meaning reflecting the populations that we serve, is a goal in leadership uh, as well as in our student body. And that is uh, written down as an aspiration uh, for us, but it's critically important uh, for this work as well. Uh, the last piece is uh, there's uh, Marka Bristow, who ran Access Living, one of our trustees, just passed away this uh, past week. She was a leading uh, advocate for the uh, rights of those who've been disabled. And the, one of the sayings from their community is, nothing about us without us. And, and that gets to the way we've set up Westside United and, uh, you know, how we have to engage our communities and patients in any kind of improvement that we do. Let me just comment. In our program, which is, as you point out, targeted towards the highest utilizers, in some sense, our biggest goal right, is to lower cost and get the money out of that system, right? But even in that population, the single largest cl cluster in that latent class analysis was people looking for healthy living and social engagement. And so that's why we built the programs that address that. If you look at the single most common social needs that people describe, those are the first two, and the next one is transportation, and then safety. Right? So these are, in fact, the things that we address in this program. They're done in parallel. But I think our most pressing job, other than to take care of the health of the patients there, is to get that money out of the system so it can go into other systems. Because that's the real problem that we face in a lot of ways. Yeah. If, 
if I may, just uh, I'm going to take this from two different angles. One is there is a desire to get what is effectively a mortgage product into health insurance that can go multi-year. Uh, the bus we're going to get in Medicare is probably a five-year uh, mortgage insurance project, which basically means um, if you sign up, they can invest early uh, and see the economic returns as you go through the five-year chassis. So there, there are clearly a financial instrument vehicles to try to establish business models that would allow some, some programming to get the preventive side up. But the other piece is also liberating information across the board. So in Dodd-Frank, we said that the consumer has the right to connect their checking and financial data to any app they trust. On their energy meter, they have the right to connect the information to an app they trust. Even in food stamps, when you ask the question, what is the most common thing that people do, moms do on food stamps? The number one thing is to check balance. Today they check balance by dialing a number and memorizing 15 digits for their PIN to get the number of their uh, piece. One Silicon Valley app developer built a little tool that said, hey, just push this button on your phone. A million people downloaded it and does it. Now, wh where does that mean? Well, that means if there was such a fiduciary operating as my uh, sort of uh, steward, they might say, hey, you're higher susceptible to diabetes and here's some phenomenally healthy meals you could make, decision support tied to your account. And by the way, Amazon just said, if, you want, if you're on Medicaid, you get a free Amazon account. All this crazy stuff's happening. It is conceivable that there could be a new, super personalized, again, big brother, the whole issue of privacy and where does it go? But ultimately, it's a decision support challenge. And behavioral economics, we didn't even talk about that as an academic profession. My colleague in the White House, Cass Sunstein, godfather of this whole thing, there's a lot we can do to help set defaults that drive towards better, better behavior. That's not nanny state, but feels a bit more empowerment. So there's just research that has to be done, and uh, hopefully the ability to organize that information in a manner that actually optimizes for that person's life. And I just, I'm excited for the future where that can happen without a lot of uh, top-down bureaucracy. Literally, three kids uh, coming out of the graduate school here could go down the street and start a little uh, organization and do something like this today. So I, I can't resist this, this spirit of intellectual honesty. So I, I came here just directly from giving a talk about behavioral economics <laughs> in health. And, and as part of this, I reviewed a meta-analysis of 300 studies of behavioral economics across every sector from finance to medicine. And, and the reality is as exciting as it is, I think it is exciting from a cost effectiveness perspective only because it is so cheap. <laughs> and that the effects themselves are, not are, at, are really not that big. And they're not that long lasting. And that is not to say that I don't think it's of value, but I really think that you know, there's only, each one is very narrow, often very time limited. I mean, think how many times you want to get pinged a day. No. And uh, you know, it, this is complicated. It is really complicated. So actually the title of my talk was Nudge as opposed to nudge. nudge. Right. Yeah. And I believe in the Me end too. that nudges are much more important than nudges. <laughs> and, and a nudge is yeah. the person and the relationship and the yep. system and the social culture. And I, and I think that nudges play a role. But I, I just don't want us to hang all our future Agreed. on them. Agreed. So on, th on that amazing note, um, yeah, please help me thank this amazing panel and our speakers. I mean, honestly, this was so much fun, so inspiring, so educational, so instructive. It knocked the socks off of uh, any expectations that I might have. So to close us out, Dr. Ranga Krishnan just has a few comments, and then I think we have a reception and a little more food and drink. Ranga. Sounds like you're going to stay on the stage. That's good. Uh, I just want to say a few things. Uh, first, thanks. Thanks to all of you, and uh, particularly Anish and uh, David for giving the lecture. It was both the lectures connected and was interesting. Uh, but I also want to thank the audience for sticking around and, more important, participating. This was actually really indicates both the interest. It also indicates the willingness to raise issues and have a conversation. 
So this is part of a series that Dr. Gabriel is planning to put together. And this room was built for the purpose of small groups, large groups, not just to have one-way conversations, but multiple and two-way conversations. It just opened about six, seven weeks ago. And this is the room itself reflects how we want things to be, which is have open, engaged conversations that we can address what we're all about. Uh, we are 11,700 odd individuals work here at Rush Medical Center. Another couple of thousand more in our two other hospital systems. That's a lot of people. You add all the families together, you're talking 30 to 45,000 people, depending on how you add it. So our family is big. And we have to also take care of our family before we take care of others. Uh, it comes, um, comes up periodically, but it also raises things that when we learn how to take care of ourselves, we also can learn how to take care of others. So a few quick comments from the conversation today. And I'm, uh, one is you're learning about the importance of data. We have entered a world where we are awash with data. It is no longer a question of saying we don't have data. We may not be able to find the data that easily, which is what open source is trying to bring. And you're going to see more and more of it. Uh, privacy is a lost business. So I don't think whether, whether we like it or not, if somebody really wants to identify you, they can figure out a way to get at it. And you are seeing it. If any of you have seen some of the science papers from Laszlo Barabasi, it's actually shocking to see how much can be generated from public information about an individual. A um, couple of things that I come across is we always tend, we always in the healthcare profession think about sickness. We don't think so much about health as David was talking about. We also forget the past. We always look towards what is not working right and what we want to do going forward. If you actually think about it, in the last 100 years, people are living longer. People are more healthy than ever before. And there are parts of the population where it is even more healthy than other parts, which is the issue of disparities there. But even with disparity, longevity has gone up. That's something we forget because the cost of our success is increased cost per person. There is, we'd never ever talk about it, but it is actually the price of success. If you live longer, there is going to be an increased cost per person associated with it. And we don't really think about it very much, but it's worth articulating it. The other component that we forget is we focus a lot on where the sick cost is highest. What David talks about and Anish is the population that the government is involved with in a big way, Medicare and to a certain extent Medicaid. But the population that has the most economic impact for the country and for the future is the young people. And the young people, um, because of a couple of things that happened, I was re-looking at what the CDC has been collecting. The CDC actually does a survey of middle school and high, high school students every year. It's a survey of what was brought up, which is behavior. There are five, six categories of behavior which drive most healthcare outcomes in addition to the social variables. They are modifiable behaviors, meaning they have impact. That data is very troubling today, really, really troubling. You look at it, every single year, it's been slowly getting worse. It's not getting better. This is not an issue of data. We know the data, just that nobody is really talking about it or doing a whole lot about it. I'll give you a few just simple numbers which connect to what we have talked about in some form or another. First is how distressed are high school kids. 30% of them report feelings of depression, persistent sadness in the last year prior to the survey, lasting two weeks or more. Drug abuse of taking non-prescription drugs, opioids in particular, has come down, but the total number of drugs, amphetamines, etc., has gone up. Can't say that we don't know. We know it's a problem. It's anonymous surveys, so we're actually getting frank conversation. What is even more striking are three things. 
uh, and that does bother and should bother us a lot. Number one is how many of the, how many of the kids, high school kids, think of committing suicide. Those numbers are striking, 17% in a year prior to the survey have thoughts of committing suicide. What is even more striking is 7.5% of them claim that they attempted suicide. And in most cases, nobody knew they did. It was mostly taking overdoses. 11.5% of them were girls. About a smaller percentage were boys. What's also striking is you see the same pattern from middle school. So you're seeing a pattern that is starting which is what you were bringing up. These things are not going to stop by t today providing more health care, figuring out better ways of providing more health care for the elderly. You're only going to be able to address it from a digitally engaged population. This is a heavily, 44% of them play games on the video more than three hours a day. That's what they're reporting. But we've got to figure out a way, how do you engage them? It's not been a focus in health systems. It's not been a focus for us, but it's a focus for our own families and kids. And I think we have to figure out a way to engage in it and plan about it. And I think a lot of what you're hearing about is conversations on different facets of a massive elephant. It's one-fifth of the economy. Anything we do there, good and bad, is going to affect a lot of things. It also means we have a unique situation. We're one of the few places that's focused on only one thing, healthcare. We're there on the education side, we're there on the research side, and we're there on the delivery side. We have a chance to actually pull it together and work together as a single team to address many of the issues. It is not going to happen by just focusing on one element or one population. It's everything. It's diversity, it's inclusion, it is gender, and it's economics. We don't talk about economics. Healthcare doesn't improve without changing the health economics of a given, not health economics, economics of a place. We know that, we've known it, but that's why I think the West Side is a great initiative. We are building the right partners to do it. I'm, I actually think Rush is uniquely situated, uh, and we have the opportunity, I think, to do the right thing, and we will. So thank you so much, and please come in on Friday for the uh, ceremony. So one more thing before we left, I want to thank Melissa and her amazing team in philanthropy, Ryan and his amazing team in communications and everybody that uh, helped put this on. So thank you all and on to some food.